witness this morning is Sir Jeremy Farrow, who is joining us online. Sir Jeremy, could you be sworn, please, or give the affirmation, if you follow the instructions from the usher? Good morning. I'm the usher this morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, if you would like to repeat after me, I understand you're taking the affirmation. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Repeat after me, please. I do solemnly, sincerely and truly... I do solemnly, sincerely and truly... Declare and affirm... Declare and confirm... Affirm... Affirm... <laughs> that the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give... Shall be the truth... Shall be the truth... The whole truth... The whole truth... And nothing but the truth... And nothing but the truth... Thank you. Could you provide your full name, please? Uh, Jeremy James Farrow. So, Jeremy, thank you for joining us this morning. May I commence, please, with your qualifications? You trained, I believe, in medicine with postgraduate training in London, Chichester, Edinburgh, Melbourne, Oxford and San Francisco. You have a DPhil PhD from the University of Oxford. You were a director of the Oxford University Clinical Research Institute at the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam from 1996 to 2013. From 2013, you were director of the Wellcome Trust and from May 2023, have you been the chief scientist at the World Health Organization? Yes, all correct. And are you giving evidence today in your personal capacity as opposed to uh, a representative of the World Health Organization? Yeah, that's correct. It's very important. I'm here totally in my personal capacity, not representing the World Health Organization or indeed previous lives at uh, Ockham Trust either. Have you, throughout your professional career, served as a chair on a multitude of advisory bodies for governments and global organisations? Were you the founding chair, in fact, of the World Health Organisation R&D blueprint um, entity or body and the founding director of the International Severe Acute Respiratory and Emerging Infection Consortium, ISARIC? Correct. And have you received a plethora of honours from a number of governments, institutes and entities? Thank you. Could I commence, please, Sir Jeremy, by asking you some questions about the United Kingdom influenza strategy document, the 2011 strategy, about which a great deal of evidence has been received by Milady's inquiry. Are you familiar with that 2011 strategy for influenza pandemic. Yeah, th thanks very much. I, can I just start as well by just reaching out with the greatest support for those who've lost lives during the COVID pandemic, affected by the COVID pandemic, uh, families that are still affected and those with long COVID, and particularly also for healthcare workers around the world who put their lives at risk in order to help all of us. Um, the influenza strategy, I think you're referring to of 2011. In 2011, I was living and working in, in Vietnam, and so I was not directly involved in the development of the strategy. Um, but it was lessons learned, indeed, after the H1M1 uh, pandemic of 2009. Uh, and so I was peripherally involved in parts of it and also in the Academy of Medical Sciences review of how clinical trials and evidence and data could be gathered in the context of epidemics and emergencies. So uh, peripherally involved in that uh, strategy. Was there a general awareness of the importance of the strategy to the United Kingdom's pandemic preparedness for influenza? Yeah, I, I think if you go back, um, bear in mind, I, I've never worked directly within government. I'm sure there are better people than me about talking about how that was perceived in government. But if you go back to the government risk registers over the over the years, then pandemic influenza um, would have been in the top risk uh, of many of those risk registers. Um, I do think coming out of 2009, that there was a issue with a sense 
and this actually is true after many epidemics, I sincerely hope it's not true after this pandemic, uh, that actually 2009 H1N1 was not quite as bad as people thought, and there was a danger globally, including in the UK, of a, a sort of child um, that, cry, that cries wolf, and that actually uh, these were less of an issue than perhaps they would. I, I, I think that did influence thinking uh, after 2009 and may have built, built into why influenza as a pandemic uh, dropped down risk registers around the world after 2011. There have been a number of references in the course of evidence to, to, to the possibility that a degree of complacency was engendered by the H1N1 swine flu pandemic because it was, by the nature of these things, relatively mild. W would you agree? Yeah, I do agree. I, I was in Mexico as part of a WHO group in May of 2009, 2009 sorry. Um, in May of 2009, the city of Mexico in four hospitals within a square kilometre were full of mostly young people with very, very severe influenza. And for many uh, of us who have been concerned and remain concerned that one of the greatest risks is an influenza pandemic of some ilk, uh, going back to 1918, um, it was entirely appropriate, in my view, in 2009, to raise the flag that this was going to cause a major global problem. In reality, as you rightly say, the severity of uh, H1N1 in 2009 was less than expected. And therefore, I think there did come a degree of complacency that actually the world was safer against an influenza pandemic than perhaps had been previously thought. And there was a lot of criticism at the time about things like stockpiling of the drug oseltamivir. Um, personally, I think uh, that criticism was unwarranted. Uh, and that actually influenza remains, among with others, but remains one of the greatest risks to humanity. And as we now watch H5N1 pandemic in animals circulate around the world in an unprecedented way, influenza is never going to go away as a threat to humanity. Thank you. So, Jeremy, whilst we, you give evidence, we slow down? Could, you, could you slow down a little? We, we obviously want to hear what you have to say, and it's important that your evidence is recorded by our hardworking stenographer and it's quite difficult apologies. if you go too fast. No apologies. apologies. It's a nervous um, occasion to be part of. Well, it, uh, it won't be for very long, Sir Jeremy, so you, I'm sure you'll survive. <laughs> the Milady has heard uh, considerable evidence about the inherent unpredictability of respiratory viruses. And, and therefore the inherent unpredictability of, of the characteristics of a pandemic which may ensue from a, a widespread pathogenic outbreak. Putting it in, in, in blunter terms, it, it's impossible to know with any degree of certainty what characteristics the outbreak may have, which viruses, respiratory viruses may eventuate, and, and, and therefore what one has to guard against. Was there a general sense at all, as far as you could tell, after 2011, that there had been a, a, a failure to focus on in, in the government guidance and the government policy in, in the United Kingdom on the inherent unpredictability of respiratory viruses and therefore on, on the risks of a non-influenza pandemic? Yeah, I, th I think that would be true in the UK. I think it would be true globally as well. Um, if you go back in the last 20 years, I mean, I started working on emerging infections in, in 1999 with an outbreak of something called Nipah virus in, in Malaysia. And so, just Jeremy, fast sorry, forward please, 20 years. please slow down. You're going very if, fast again. You have to I steel apologize. yourself to go slower than you otherwise would. If we look from 1999 to 2019, that 20-year period, and just look at the number of regional or global events that have led to major disruption, uh, SARS-1, which I was involved in in Vietnam, H5M1, Zika, MERS, another coronavirus, um, the pandemic of 2009, uh, and many others as well. Uh, it is clear that we're living in an age of a pandemic age where, as Mike Ryan at WHO has said, uh, we're living in an age which is going to have more frequent and more complex 
uh, pandemics. And yet it is extraordinarily difficult when governments are faced with dealing with the challenges of day to day to also put in place those critical infrastructures, resilience and surge capacity and spare capacity uh, that would allow to deal with the unexpected uh, but, but inevitable uh, disruptions that are going to occur. So I think in the UK and around the world, uh, despite the warnings of the last 20 years, there has been a complacency about the need to prepare for these sorts of major disruptive events, which go well beyond health to the whole of society. Uh, and the UK, yes, um, uh, was complacent in regard to planning for that. Is it your view that epidemics will become more frequent, more complex perhaps, and, and harder to prevent and contain as a result of the well-known issues of changing ecology, uh, urbanization, climate change, uh, and increased travel and movement of human beings? Yeah, you've hit the major features that I would have outlined absolutely. These are features of the 21st century. Uh, they're not going to go away. It would be a grave mistake, in my view, to see each of these episodes. I've, I've outlined some of them, but there are more. To each, see each one as a discrete episode. They are telling us something far deeper about how the world is changing. Uh, biodiversity loss, environment, climate change, urbanization, trade and travel, as you said. Slow down. And what I'd like to, for us to move away from is thinking that this is a discrete episode which we can put in a box and think about and think more about the systemic way that we need to address these more frequent and more complex events. If we look at Ebola in West Africa in 2014, the Ebola virus had not changed. People had not changed. What had changed was the social circumstances in which it happened, not in villages that could be isolated and quarantined and an epidemic brought under control quickly, but in major capital cities and across borders. And that more frequent and indeed sociologically more complex epidemics and pandemics is what we will face in the future. Does it follow, Sir Jeremy, that from the vantage point of governments and with a view to the, the necessary and important process by which risks are identified, assessed, and planned for, that there must be a, a much greater focus now, both in light of COVID and, of course, because of the increased general risks to which you've referred, upon firstly identifying multiple scenarios as opposed to just influenza. Secondly, focusing additionally on how to prevent catastrophic consequence as opposed to managing catastrophic consequence. And thirdly, thinking more and to a much greater extent about the necessary countermeasures that may need to be deployed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the first thing I'd say is what you have before a crisis hits will, to a large extent, determine your ability to respond to it. If you have deep inequalities in your society, if you have uh, uh, a large degree of ill health in terms of health issues, uh, if you have health services which are stretched to the limit, um, if you have fragmented government approaches such that each individual vertical structure considers its area, but there's a challenge to, to look at the to all of society perspective, uh, then trying to cobble together a horizontal approach, an all of government and all of society approach in a, a set of vertical systems is extraordinarily difficult. And tabletop exercises will get you so far. But you need to be working in those systems all of the time if you want those systems to work when a crisis hits. And I think we need to think more strongly about how totally disruptive all of society events, of which this is a good example, uh, will be dealt with at a cross-government, whole-of-society approach, rather than just as a single ministry approach. A, a vital component in the whole-of-society approach is, of course, having adequate scientific advice, as well as, and alongside 
a, a adequate and sufficient research base. Could I focus firstly, please, on, on the issue of the scientific advisory networks which are available in the United Kingdom? You were a member of SAGE, the, the stand-up, uh, that is say, a committee which is stood up in the event of emergencies uh, in relation to Zika and Ebola. Is, is that correct? Correct. And have you had extensive experience throughout your long career of dealing with the, the scientific advisory structures in the United Kingdom beyond SAGE? Yes. Evidence was given by Professor Sir Chris Whitty that the, the UK science advisory system, whilst complex and not perfect, is considered to be one of the stronger ones internationally. W would you agree? Yes. What must be done to ensure that that remains the position in terms of resourcing or funding or, or uh, a continuing focus on understanding the vital importance of scientific advice? So I would agree with those comments and I've been involved um, in some of your introductory remarks with a number of other governments around the world um, of all economic levels of growth um, and, and uh, depth of scientific background. My view is, is that the construct of having a, a, a chief scientific advisor in every ministry, close to the minister, close to the system, close to the senior civil servants, not just structured in a crisis, but there every day, and learning to bridge the cultural and language complexity that is there within different disciplines and different ways of working and different educational backgrounds and everything else. Building that structure to be permanent, to be functioning all the time, and critically providing value and utility to a government machinery all of the time is, I believe, critical. And I've argued with many other countries, not argued, discussed with many other countries that actually the UK system of scientific advice in every ministry brought together under a chief scientist, uh, networked together, providing mutual support to each other is absolutely critical, must be maintained, must be strengthened. The very best people in science should be encouraged to go into it uh, and on a rotational basis so that they can retain their scientific uh, expertise and skills uh, and then network together through the chief scientist. That, to me, is the best system in the world uh, and should, everything should be done to maintain it, not for crisis time, but for all the time uh, to deal with the day-to-day -day issues as well as be able to respond when a crisis inevitably hits. It's plain, Sir Jeremy, that in the particular context of dealing with the COVID pandemic, SAGE and the scientific advisory structures in the United Kingdom government drew to a very large extent, of course, upon biomedical expertise. Because of the need to, to consider at speed and in very difficult circumstances that the consequences of societal measures, social restrictions, mandatory quarantining and so on and so forth. It may be the case that there was a, an absence of sufficient expertise from non-biomedical professionals, that is to say economists and behavioral scientists or social scientists uh, and um, experts, not from the world of health and, and not from the world of, of science, but, but from the social sciences. Would you agree with that? F from your experience of SAGE, do you think that it is, in a general sense, sufficiently diverse? So I would agree with some of that, but not all of it. Um, firstly, I think that SAGE uh, is often seen as the names officially on the SAGE list, uh, which I think counts to 30 or 40 people or so. Behind that, there were hundreds of people involved, and, and particularly on some of the areas you mentioned there, uh, behavioural science, for instance. I think uh, the input into the behavioural scientists uh, into SAGE from throughout my time on SAGE, I thought was of the very highest 
quality. Um, where I think, I, where I do agree with you, is that uh, there was no, there were two things lacking in my view. One is the sage health, public health, behavioral science perspectives on the pandemic uh, were not mirrored with other equally transparent and debated issues that brought the whole of the society elements together. And I believe, I've never been in government, but I believe that a better approach would have been to have a SAGE that focuses on its area of expertise, definitely including behavioral science, international perspective, ethics, many of the things you mentioned. But that would be mirrored, in my view, through the cabinet office with a similar transparent uh, expert group that would consider other aspects that are absolutely critical to an all of society response. I think if you are SAGE to do all of that, it would become huge, unwieldy, and wouldn't be able to have the clarity, given in mind that SAGE was meeting at some point every 24 or 48 hours. So personally, I would do that through the Cabinet Office, but have equal transparency with elements that considered other aspects beyond the health agenda. And the second thing I would suggest, and I was part of this in a US group, um, is that there is outside the SAGE system, but linked to it in a constructive way, if you like, a red team. A red team that would have access to other the, the same information, but would be able to constructively challenge the thinking uh, from the outside and wouldn't be within the room at the same time. I thought that worked extremely well when I was part of a similar enterprise in the United States. Uh, and I would like to see that set up. Independent Sage, I think, tried to do that. But unfortunately, for reasons others can debate, sometimes it became more confrontational than perhaps was uh, constructive. A, a red team w would plainly be in a position to challenge orthodoxy. Did you mean orthodoxy on the part of the government or, or, or orthodoxy or alleged orthodoxy on the part of the scientists in SAGE or a mirror group who, who I think I should tell you have described themselves in this inquiry in various terms such as being self-correcting or on another occasion as being licensed dissidents. Do, do, do scientists need to be challenged in that way? Or, or, or is this a point made more directly against um, administrators and government employees? Science absolutely has to be challenged. And I, and I think, uh, unfortunately, I'm not aware that, that beyond the summaries been released, uh, I think, at the behest of uh, Patrick Valance, uh, crucially, uh, it's a shame that actually SAGE wasn't recorded in some ways, because I think within the SAGE discussions that I was always part of, there was a very high degree of challenge. But to have an outside group, a red group, that just puts in questions, have you thought about this, have you thought about that, have you considered that, who are not part of, the, of that uh, formal group, I think, my own experience of that is from the United States, and there I, uh, I thought it was very helpful to be able to do that. It doesn't diminish the authority or the voice of SAGE, uh, but it would give you some of that external challenge. Uh, I think within the Cabinet Office, uh, to me, that is where the political challenge of is this the right thing to do, closing schools, closing economies, whatever it might be, should be held. But I think those need also to be transparent in the same way that SAGE was with its minutes and summaries so that people can actually, as a public, can actually challenge those assumptions as well. All right. Mr Keithy, are you going further into the mirror group? No, I was going to move to the question of specialist committees. I just, I just have a brief summary of what Sir Jeremy means by the, the mirror group, which experts, what, how would it work? Yes, so Sir so Jeremy, a few moments ago, in, in response to a question for myself as to whether or not the constitution, the, the, the makeup of SAGE was sufficiently diverse, you, you suggested the possibility of a mirror group not, not as part of SAGE itself, because it would become too unwieldy and, and too large to be convened at speed and in very difficult circumstances, but, but a separate committee comprising um, experts, uh, specialists from different professional walks of life. Could, could you expand on that? You, you referred to social scientists, economists uh, and, and others. Is there anything more that you want to say about that in terms of its composition? Well, I think the social scientists and behavioural scientists were absolutely fundamental to SAGE itself. So, so I, I, I certainly... But I think um, a group 
outside of what I call a red team that was able to uh, uh, throw in questions into Sage. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Some of that happened informally um, through things like in the UK, the Royal Society, Academy of Medical Sciences, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and obviously in the lay and scientific literature. But I, I, having been part for some time in the US of that red group, which brought together, yes, epidemiologists, biomedical people, social scientists, economists, people thinking outside the box, um, that was helpful, I think, in terms of uh, uh, the US approach to this, which I have to say, I believe was not as well constructed and organized as was SAGE, uh, would be my view, having seen both operating. So those specialists and scientists and professionals are, are in terms of their own professional qualifications, mirror images of the constituent parts of SAGE. They're not, they're not from other walks of uh, professional life. They, they are there to, to challenge, if you like, the members of SAGE on their own turf. No, no, I, I, I wouldn't. No, sorry, let me clarify. I think in, in that sort of red group, you could easily have um, a, a, a broader sector of society, civic society, industry, uh, people, yes, with expertise and understanding of public health, but also others who would bring a different perspective. Right. So, Jeremy, can I ask you now about your experience, please, of, of some of the, the more specialist scientific committees concerned with pathogenic outbreaks? Uh, have you had dealings over the years with uh, HAIRS, the, the Human Animal Infections and Risk Surveillance Committee, or... ACDP, the Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens, or on the now abolished NEPNI. Are those committees, although you weren't in government, with which you've had any experience? No, I was not part of any of those. The, 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 the greater experience I had um, was actually outside the UK, as you mentioned, um, being the, the founding chair of the WHO R&D Blueprint, advisory and WHO committees and the other governments, but I was never involved in any of those that you mentioned there. All right. You, you've referred in the course of your evidence to the growing risks of pathogenic outbreaks, particularly of the viral respiratory kind, and to the growing risks generally because of changes in our environment and our way of life. To what extent is it essential to meet those continuing and growing risks that we maintain as a country capability, that is to say, the medical, scientific and social weapons at our disposal to meet a future pandemic? So I started off by saying what, what you have before a pandemic or any crisis hits makes such a huge difference. Um, there are many things to question and challenge, and that's the role of the public inquiry in terms of the pandemic. But I think we can only celebrate the remarkable um, scientific, and by scientific I mean the broad sciences, contribution to the pandemic in the UK and around the world. Um, that you can't turn that on in a crisis. Uh, we didn't make a vaccine in 12 months. We made a vaccine because for years before, all governments in the UK of any colour, uh, I would argue as well, the Wellcome Trust, the charitable sector, philanthropy, have invested in basic science, in people, in teams, in institutions. And if you look through the development of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, if you look at COG UK building off years of work at the Wellcome Genome Centre, if you look at the recovery trial, uh, uh, if you look at when local authorities and others through public health got involved in their communities through uh, uh, ownership and knowledge of those communities, um, those were absolutely world leading. Those are the results of decades of investment in fundamental science and its translation. A brilliant regulator, MHRA now, and when it was part of the EMA, is one of the world's, if not the world's best regulator. They were critical, understanding ethics. So this infrastructure in the UK is something the UK should be incredibly proud of, must maintain, and has a critical role to play internationally. 
is that a capability which uh, is that a capability without which it, it is impossible to scale up the necessary medical and clinical responses in the event of a pandemic? Is that something which must be maintained because without it, we would not have the building blocks to be able to, to mount a defence in the event of a pandemic? Absolutely agree with that. Um, as I say, the vaccine was not made in a year. Um, if you don't maintain that capacity, and if that capacity isn't valued, isn't funded, is not providing value and utility all of the time. We should remember that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine came off a team, uh, Sarah Gilbert, Andy Pollard, and many others have been working on MERS vaccines, they've been working on typhoid vaccines, they've been working on meningitis vaccines, and were able to pivot. The recovery trial built off years of investment, particularly from the National Institute of Health Research and the clinical trials capacity. Uh, these are absolute jewels in the UK's crown. They could play, in my view, a bigger role internationally, but you have to maintain them every Monday, every Tuesday, and you have to value them, and they must provide value either in enhancing knowledge and our understanding of the world, or in translation into products, countermeasures for people in a pandemic. If we do not retain that scientific infrastructure, then the UK will be woefully underprepared to deal with today's challenges and tomorrow's inevitable epidemics. Does that infrastructure include matters such as having sufficient uh, laboratory services, for example, to be able to scale up mass diagnostic testing in the event of a new pandemic and, and perhaps a, a different testing device? What, what, what sort of laboratory infrastructure is required to be able to provide that building block to enable us to scale up in the next crisis? The testing capacity in the first three months of 2020 in the UK was woefully inadequate. It wasn't possible to scale that up um, at the speed that was required. And testing got way behind the speed of the epidemic. And in epidemics and pandemics, there is no point saying we're quicker than we used to be if you're slower than the speed of the epidemic. And if you get behind that curve, you'll really struggle to catch up. Uh, remembering that exponential growth, doubling time every two days, means even 48 hours later, you've lost, you've got behind the curve. And the data you have today is in the rear view mirror. It's what happened yesterday that you're seeing, not what happened today. So unless you have that diagnostic capacity, I would personally like to see a, mo a much closer interrelationship between what we call public health, public health laboratories, uh, clinical and NHS facilities, and the broad and very strong research environment in the UK. Often these are almost competing with each other rather than seeing themselves as part of a common approach. And I think to forge together public health laboratories, local authorities, hospitals and clinical facilities, general practice, primary care, and the research endeavour, and make sure that those are working together outside the pandemic and can much better work together in a pandemic would be a huge progress in terms of our ability to have the resilience in the future. So drawing those threads together, Sir Jeremy, would you agree that both in terms of research capacity, but also infrastructure, laboratories, technicians and the like. Yeah, it is vital, we, we, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't quite finished. It's vital that capability is maintained for both, uh, for, for not just diagnostic testing, but antivirals and also vaccines to which you've referred. So it, it, this is a capability which must be maintained across the board for those three pillars, if you like, of pathogenic outbreak response. Yeah, I, I, I would actually add to that. The social science, the behavioral science must be integrated as part of that, not some separate thing that goes on in other conversations. Um, but we must maintain that all the time. The only way to maintain it, and if we're not to repeat the lessons of all of the epidemics 
I mentioned at the start. The only way we can maintain this is if it is integrated into services and health provision, prevention and treatment every Monday, every Tuesday, every week, every month. Because after every previous epidemic, after Ebola, the world said, never again. We must build these capacities. And sadly, one or two or three years later, the pandemic hasn't happened and they start to be cut. So my view is instead of creating yet more vertical structures that will somehow be there when a pandemic strikes, build it into systems that are of use every day, people are using them, they provide value to communities, and then they can pivot when it's necessary. If we look at COG UK as a good example, established by Sharon Peacock, it was building off years of public health interest in genomics, and the Wellcome uh, Trust uh, uh, Genome Centre and institutes like the Crick, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Manchester and others, Biobank. These are critical infrastructures. They're providing value and utility all of the time and they have critically the people who can pivot when necessary. We must not lose this capacity. Turning now finally to, to a more administrative or, or governmental angle, and the issue of countermeasures. Is it your view that further work is also required to be done in terms of thinking about evaluating, working out the consequences of the, the, the policy interventions with which we're now all only too familiar, such as quarantining, social distancing, the efficacy of face masks, airport screening and so on, all of which of course came very much into focus during COVID, but perhaps have not been developed in terms of the thinking as far as they, they, they might be. Yes, I do agree with that. And, and, and having listened to some, some previous interventions uh, and the concern that everything was based around the potential flu pandemic and no other thinking. Things I would say on that, flu remains the number one biggest risk. Um, uh, but we should be thinking beyond flu uh, in terms of a crisis management system that would be agnostic to what the event was. And it could be respiratory, most likely. It could be sexual. It could be uh, through the gastrointestinal. So there's all sorts of scenarios. And instead of getting plugged into a single outcome which we feel comfortable with, perhaps more important is to think, whilst we will focus on flu because it's hugely important and is the most, the highest risk, and it remains so, that nevertheless we must have a system which allows us actually to cope with whatever is thrown at us and have the resilience and the spare capacity and not the whole system stretched to its very limit in order not to be able to respond when the, in, the demand increases. So. I would like to think more broadly, uh, more like an incident management group than a, than a flu-specific group, um, without losing the knowledge that flu remains a huge, uh, a huge risk to us all. And those policy interventions that you talk about need a discussion at societal level. Um, the word lockdown, none of us had heard of it before about February or March of 2020. Uh, the implications of it are huge and long-standing. Um, we, we should be able to debate those in the inter-epidemic periods and, and come to a societal discussion about what we're going to prioritise, what we're going to protect, uh, and what we may have to do in order to prevent an event like COVID-19 happening again. So, Jeremy, thank you very much. Um, Milady, I believe you granted permission to Welsh covid bereaved for an issue or issues surrounding the question of face masks to be explored through my own examination. Um, so Jeremy, could I return you please to the, to the question of face masks? Um, the, the issue of face masks and their efficacy is very much going to be a matter for consideration in my lady's module two in this inquiry, um, because of course there was a a huge debate about face masks once COVID had, had hit. But in the context of preparedness, may I ask you this, to what extent pre-COVID, 
was the wearing of face masks an issue which was thought about, sufficiently developed, uh, and, and views reached upon? And an associated question, to, to what extent was there pre-COVID a scientific consensus on the efficacy of face masks, putting aside how, eff how effective they actually were. So was there a standing scientific consensus on the efficacy of face masks pre-COVID? And to what extent had thinking on face masks developed pre-COVID? Well, I think in the UK that consensus did not exist. Um, and the effectiveness, as well as the efficacy of face masks, uh, I do not believe in the UK there was a, a consensus on that. Having spent 20, almost 20 years living in Vietnam through SARS uh, and H5N1, and then watching very closely and being very involved in the responses in China, in Korea, in Vietnam and Singapore, four countries that had previously dealt with SARS-1 and with other emergencies, I think if you ask there, there was a clear consensus amongst the decision makers and indeed the scientists and healthcare workers that face masks had a role in contributing to the public health intervention. In public health, there is rarely a magic bullet. Uh, public health, the analogy of the Swiss cheese model of having multiple interventions is crucial. If you're expecting face masks to give you 95 protection against something, you won't get it. But as part of a series of interventions, which includes face masks, includes hand washing, and includes uh, clean air and, and, and uh, spacing between individuals, and then when you have the countermeasures you're talking about, diagnostic tests, treatment, and vaccines, together they create a Swiss cheese model of what how public health is. Each one contributes a percentage. None of them on their own contribute enough to change the dynamic of a pandemic, but together, they can have a, a very profound impact. And when you talk about countermeasures, often we talk about countermeasures in terms of therapeutics and vaccines and diagnostic testing. But countermeasures need to be seen in the full Swiss cheese model. They need to include social distancing. They need to include masks. They need to include hand washing. They need to include in other uh, epidemic potentials, other interventions, for instance, in HIV, condoms, etc. So I think we would be wiser, and the evidence base on face masks, unfortunately, was we had large clinical trials for therapeutics, the recovery trial, we had the vaccine trials. We missed an opportunity during the pandemic to gather robust, strong, prospective data on non-pharmacological interventions, which are a critical component of any response to an epidemic and pandemic until you have those countermeasures that will then change the course of the pandemic. So. What I would plead for is we don't see countermeasures just as something you inject into somebody's arm or you take as a tablet, but we see countermeasures in a Swiss cheese model of public health, which integrates them all. And we find the evidence for how they work on their own, and we find the evidence for how they work together. So, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed. So, Jeremy, thank you very much indeed for your help. It's been extremely interesting, and we're very grateful to you. Thank you. I wish you the very best with the public inquiry um, and offer all the support we can to it. The lessons must be learned and we must never be there again. Thank you. Milady, I think that we can proceed to the next witness straight away. If somebody would be good enough to sever the link with Sir Jeremy, we'll return to the witness box. Just before um, Ms. Sturgeon uh, gives evidence, um, I'd like to apologise to those who were inconvenienced by the fact we didn't call Ms. Calderwood on Wednesday morning. Uh, it was due entirely to um, unforeseen circumstances, and I can assure people we gave everyone as much notice as we could, uh, and as we got, in, in fact. So, Lydia, yes. apologies to anybody.
Could the witness be sworn, please? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Could you give the inquiry, please, your full name? Uh, Nicola Sturgeon. Ms Sturgeon, thank you for offering your assistance and providing it to this inquiry. But whilst you give evidence, could you please remember to keep your voice up so that we may all clearly hear what you have to say and also for our hard-working sonographer so that she can record your evidence. Excuse me. Excuse me, my lady, with your permission, would it be possible to say a few words by way of introduction? You may. Uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, am appearing at this public inquiry for the first time, and as the First Minister of Scotland uh, for the duration of the pandemic, I wanted to take a brief opportunity to offer my sympathies and condolences to all those who have suffered as a result of COVID-19. The pandemic may be over, uh, but for very many people that suffering continues to this day and there is not a day that passes uh, that I don't think about that. Uh, secondly, I want to convey my thanks to all those who contributed to the national response, obviously to our health and care workforce, but to all of those across the public, voluntary and private sectors. Uh, and of course, to the general public who did everything that was asked of them and made extraordinary sacrifices. Uh, finally, my lady, uh, I know that every day uh, the government I led uh, did our best to take the best possible decisions. Uh, but equally, I know that we did not get everything right. Uh, the learning from the pandemic is of critical importance and uh, this public inquiry has a central role to play in ensuring that those lessons are learned and therefore I appreciate the opportunity to be here before you for the first occasion today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms Turgeon. You say the first occasion because, of course, um, it's known to my lady but, but not necessarily the wider world that you, you will be giving evidence again before this inquiry for the purposes of, of Module 2A, which will be the module that will be more particularly concerned with the response to the pandemic once, of course, it had struck. Um, Ms Sturgeon, you've provided kindly a, a witness statement dated, I think, the 19th of April 2023. We needn't bring it up, but it's a, a, a witness statement to which you have appended your signature and a statement of truth. Is that correct? That's correct. You were, of course, as you said, the first minister of Scotland, but earlier in your career, you were deputy first minister and cabinet secretary for health. And coincidentally, that was during the swine flu pandemic, which hit the United Kingdom in 2009. Is that correct? That is correct. And so you, you would have become familiar with the exquisite difficulties of dealing with the onset of a pandemic uh, on a country uh, and familiar with governmental response. Yes. Just to get our bearings, it, it, that pandemic, H191, as we've heard, was, by the general standards of these things, relatively mild, was it not? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, milder, thankfully, than any of us had expected at the outset of it. There were some 1,500 hospitalisations in Scotland, fortuitously no deaths, I believe, but of course there were around about 17,000 deaths globally. <laughs> there may therefore be a limit as to what lessons could have been learnt from that milder pandemic. But the Scottish Government commissioned a paper, did it not, to review its own response to that pandemic? We did, yes. And was that a, a, a report or a paper that you yourself commissioned? Uh, yes, I believe I would have commissioned that as Health Secretary at the time. Um, may we have, please, that paper on the screen, 102936. 
it's, it's headed Cabinet Subcommittee on Scottish Government Resilience, Influenza H191 Pandemic Review of the Scottish Government Response, and it was a paper by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing. You were Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Health, and therefore may we presume that was you? Um, I'd have to check the date of it to see whether I was still uh, Health Secretary when that paper was produced, but I, I believe that would have been me, yes. I think the, the paper was produced in, in 2011. You were Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health until the 19th of May 2011. Uh, I was Cabinet Secretary for Health in two, uh, late 2012. Uh, yes. That would, that would have been uh, me in that case. Yes. You, you were Cabinet Secretary for Health until the 19th of May 2011, and then you became Cabinet Secretary for Health, Wellbeing and City Strategy thereafter. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Page five of the report refers at the bottom of the page to planning assumptions. Respondents recognised the limitations of modelling. However, it was felt that it would have been helpful to have updated the planning assumptions more quickly to reflect the picture on the ground in effect reflecting the most likely scenario rather than the worst case scenario. Respondents felt it would have been helpful for the process of testing the planning assumptions to be more explicit. The planning assumptions which were published did not hold much weight with responders on the grounds that they did not reflect what they were experiencing. Ms Sturgeon, these references to the planning assumptions and to national and local responders' views as, as to how efficient or how useful that they were. Was that a reference um, to the, the broad governmental system by which risks are assessed, grouped together, and assumptions made for the purposes of planning as to how those risks should be addressed? So my reading of these paragraphs, and uh, for, forgive me, I would need to see these paragraphs in the context of the whole paper to be certain that what I'm about to say is correct. Uh, but uh, certainly in relation to the second bullet point there, uh, what that seems to me to reflect is something that was certainly uh, true in the handling of the H1N1 uh, pandemic, is that uh, the, the pandemic did not unfold in the way that the plans and the modelling and the reasonable worst case scenario estimates had indicated that it would. And, and that had uh, relevance, I, I think, to what we learned uh, about the, the strengths and weaknesses of pre-pandemic uh, planning. Um, so my reading of that is that that was a statement about the, the gap that opened up during the, the swine flu pandemic between what the plan told us would happen and what in reality happened. That issue, the divergence between risk assessment, plan, identification of response, and the reality of a pandemic was an issue that continued to bedevil this area of strategy planning, did it not? Uh, yes, it, it did. I think that is fair comment. Um, I also, having uh, now in different capacities, as we've been covering, been involved in the, the response to two pandemics, uh, I, to some extent, think that there is an inevitability about uh, that being a problem uh, that will always exist to some extent, because there is no plan uh, that will ever completely replicate what happens in reality when a pandemic, unfortunately, confronts us. Indeed. And page 11, relatedly, In the middle of the page, there is this heading, actions to be taken forward as part of the UK-wide review into the influenza A H1N1 response. Was that a reference to the review which was carried out, in fact, by Dame Deirdre Hine? Uh, that would have been a reference to the Hine review, yes. We'll oversee the work of the review team through Scottish Government representation on the reference group. We'll consider the implications for Scotland of the emerging findings, 
specifically those relating to, and then the bottom bullet point, future iterations of the pandemic flu mm. framework. Was that reference to pandemic flu framework a reference to the then pre-existing Scottish strategy for dealing with pandemic flu and also the perspective, the anticipated United Kingdom strategy for dealing with influenza pandemic, which we'll come to in a moment. Mm -hmm. So I suspect um, that that would have been effectively uh, both of those things. It would have been a reference to whatever pandemic flu framework uh, was in existence at the time, the pre-existing Scottish government one, and then what became the UK-wide uh, pandemic flu preparedness plan uh, in 2011. Thereafter, Ms Sturgeon, as, as my lady has heard um, in the course of evidence, under the Four Nations approach, the United Kingdom drew up and disseminated a, a new 2011 strategy, mm -hmm. and that is, or became, the sole strategy for dealing with pandemics. And it was, of course, a strategy which on its face dealt only with influenza pandemic. There was a commitment there in that review by the Scottish Government to keeping future iterations of the pandemic strategy under review. But to a very large extent, that did not happen, did it? The 2011 uh, Four Nations plan uh, was not updated. Um, now, ha for that to have been updated on a Four Nations basis would obviously have required the engagement of, of all four governments. Um, in, in my view, and this takes us to the heart of some of the most important lessons I learned uh, from the, the swine flu pandemic, had that uh, plan been updated, I do not necessarily think it would have changed substantially. I think I heard Professor Sir Chris Whitty make a, a similar point to you uh, last week. Uh, that a review, refresh, uh, different iteration of that would not have changed necessarily uh, the fundamental assumptions or, or planning or, or modelling at the heart of it. In brief, the, the two lessons that I took from swine flu uh, in relation to plans uh, were firstly, and I've already touched on this, the importance of any plan being adaptable and flexible when it first confronts reality. Um, in, in summary, what happened in, in swine flu was that as the, the pandemic, thankfully, turned out to be milder than we had anticipated, there was a period when the governments tried to make the pandemic fit the plan rather than adapt the plan to the pandemic. So flexibility is the first point. The second point, uh, I guess, relates to that is the importance of whatever is on the paper in the form of a plan that is work done to operationalise and test that plan. I'm sure we'll come on to some questions around exercise Cygnus on a UK basis, Silver Swan on a Scottish basis to a lesser extent because it was looking at MERS, SARS rather than flu, exercise Iris. Um, but the work that was done through these exercises and the work in Scotland that was done by uh, local resilience partnerships sitting underneath our regional resilience partnerships, in my view, was more important than having tweaked versions of a plan uh, that was only ever going to be a template for the situation that we ultimately found ourselves dealing with. As it turned out, Ms Sturgeon, the reality was that the plan, the strategy, the 2011 document required not just tweaking, and it may well be that it wouldn't just have stopped at tweaking had it been significantly revised. It was, and it's been described by a variety of witnesses, as wholly inadequate, strategically. Mm. And do you accept that, that there is now a, a much clearer understanding as to the, the nature and the degree of the inadequacy of that document? Um, so, yes, and if... If I may, I'll perhaps try to break that down briefly into to two parts. Please. Um, and, and perhaps give a little bit more explanation for my use of the term tweak. Um, had the, a process to update that plan focused on updating an influenza preparedness plan, I can't be sure about this, but I do not believe it would have changed significantly because it would still have been a plan uh, dealing with the potential for a flu pandemic. Had it been uh, a process designed to turn a flu plan into a plan that was looking at a different range of pandemics, that may have been a more substantive uh, exercise. Um, 
In terms of your question, do I accept that the plan was inadequate? Um, in summary, yes, the plan uh, was for a different type of pandemic than the one we uh, unfortunately uh, were confronted with. What I would say in addition, though, is that that does not mean no part of that plan was useful in any way, because some of the consequence planning for a pandemic, I mean, there are some, as we know, and we'll come on to no doubt today and in future modules, significant differences with significant consequences between flu and what we ended up dealing with in terms of a coronavirus pandemic. But some of the consequences were similar. So I would, uh, I guess, push back a little bit uh, against the notion that there was nothing in the flu planning that served us any purpose at all when it came to COVID-19. You would accept, I think, that there was no plan for non-influenza pandemic, at least on, on its own face, correct? Uh, that, no, that is absolutely the case. Uh, that is not to say that there was no thinking within governments ar no. around non-influenza diseases, you know, high consequence uh, infectious diseases. Uh, exercise Iris, which was a Scottish government exercise, looked at that specifically. What there wasn't, and I think this is the significant gap, um, is there was no set plan, which as I say is not the same as saying there was no thinking, uh, into how we dealt with a pandemic that had uh, features and characteristics of flu in terms of transmissibility, but also uh, the severity and the what we came to understand in terms of the asymptomatic trans transmission of COVID-19. So if, if we look at Exercise Iris, it was looking at a mere SARS type incident, but not a pandemic, one that was small and, and very contained. Yes. So I would readily accept uh, that there was a gap uh, in terms of the pandemic we uh, ultimately were dealing with. Um, but, as I say, that does not mean the plan that was in place had no uh, utility at all. No. And, and I'm not suggesting it had no utility. The plan on its face called for flexible yeah. application. It called for flexibility. It proclaimed the fact that viral respiratory pathogenic outbreaks are, by their nature, inherently uh, unpredictable. Yeah. And, therefore, that the plan should be applied to non-influenza pandemics. But there was no development of that thinking, was there, in the plan? There was no debate about what those inherently unpredictable characteristics might consist of, the differences in the transmission rate, yeah. or viral load, or severity, or incubation period. That's correct, isn't it? That, that, that is correct. Um, that said, and I uh, obviously I'm not uh, a scientific clinical expert in any uh, way, shape or form, uh, but it may have been difficult to capture the, the range of possibilities that you, you've just alluded to there in a single plan. I, I think the other point I would make about uh, the utility or otherwise of plans, had the flu plan been uh, reviewed and turned into something that was looking at pandemics uh, or the potential pandemics more widely, whether that plan uh, would have served its purpose would have depended on the capabilities that lay underneath that plan. So I'm straying slightly perhaps into future modules here, but for me, the questions uh, in my mind, literally every day are, are not so much did we lack a plan, but did we lack the capabilities for dealing with a, a pandemic of the nature of COVID-19? And obviously I'm talking there about contact tracing, testing Indeed. infrastructure in particular. But you would accept, Ms Sturgeon, that had the plan focused more plainly, more clearly on the inherent unpredictability, uh, unpredictability of viral respiratory pathogens and their characteristics, and identified that the next pandemic might have different characteristics to influenza in terms of transmission rate, incubation period, viral load, severity, it is likely there would have been a much closer and clearer debate about the necessary countermeasures. For example, mass diagnostic testing, mass contact tracing, social restrictions, quarantining and so on. And that debate was wholly absent, wasn't it, from that strategy and from all the contemporaneous material. 
Uh, much of that, yes, I, I was was absent from that. So I, I, I do think that is is fair. Um, and yes, I, uh, with retrospect and in hindsight, I, I think we would all have benefited from much earlier discussion around some of, of these things. I, I suppose the only point I'm making, maybe this comes from uh, too, too many years in government not now, obviously, is I, I think there is a real danger um, in putting an overemphasis on plans. There is a there is often um, a tendency in government to say, well, we have a plan, it sits on the shelf, and so we've done the preparation. And it's what, as I think you're putting to me fairly, it's what lies underneath that. And had there been a plan that looked at the range of pandemics other than flu, then yes, it is possible uh, that we would have had a uh, greater discussion around some of the elements that, of course, came very much to the fore when COVID struck. The reason I put the question to you, Ms Sturgeon, the way that I did what, what was to respond to your suggestion that the strategic, acknowledged strategic flaws in the plan may not have mattered because what matters more is capability. Absolutely. My point to you is, had there been a proper development of the issues of the required countermeasures necessary to meet properly identified risks of non-influenza pandemics in that document, that capability is likely to have been better developed by the time COVID struck. I, th I think that is, is fair, and I, I would accept that. Um, I, I think it would come down to how precise some of those other of uh, predictions or, or models had been. But I, I think that is a, a fair comment to put to me. And your, your point about the, the danger in government of selecting a plan in the reasonable expectation that it will do what it says on the tin and it will meet the need of the, the exigency or emergency which has arisen. Would you agree that that plan tended to focus upon managing the catastrophic consequences of, on, of a pandemic influenza as opposed to trying to prevent those catastrophic consequences from developing in the first um, I, I'm not sure I do entirely agree with that. And again, I'm, I'm perhaps straying from your question being anchored in the flu preparedness plan and projecting a little bit to some of the commentary that's been made around the handling of, of COVID. Um, I, I suppose, you know, there is a question in my mind in the context of a pandemic, what do we mean by prevention? I, I think there is a question about whether any single country at a population level could prevent, i.e. stop a pandemic happening. Clearly there are measures at an individual level that people try to take to prevent uh, themselves getting it. But in the context of a pandemic, it is, and I can only speak for myself and the Scottish Government here, it was never the case when COVID struck uh, that we just accepted as a given that a reasonable worst case scenario was going to unfold. It was our determination uh, from the outset to do everything we could, and I think this is what prevention means in the pandemic context, to suppress it to the maximum. The questions, uh, I think, uh, that are really important for us all to consider uh, very, very frankly, is could or should we have done more to suppress to the maximum COVID? But speaking on behalf of the government I led at the time, it was never the case that we simply accepted there is a level of harm that is going to be done uh, by this virus and, and we accept that. We were always, in fact, it became later on one of the points of difference between the Scottish and the UK government, the extent to which we were still seeking to suppress as opposed to live with the virus. Um, so I, I don't accept that there was ever, certainly in my mind, an acceptance of a level of harm that we were you know, willing to, to have unfold. That was not, however, my question, Ms Turgeon. My question revolved around the strategy and whether you accepted that one of the unintended consequences of that strategy was that it tended to focus administrative concentration on trying to deal with the, the consequences of a catastrophic emergency rather than preventing it in the first place. For example, You've already acknowledged that the absence of thinking on the two main methods by which 
catastrophic consequences can be prevented, mass diagnostic testing and mass contact tracing were wholly absent from this strategic debate. So for, forgive me if you thought I wasn't answering your question. I was seeking to, to try to answer your question, but I perhaps went on to COVID more than the, the flu plan. The, I think one of your, your questions, which is reasonable, is the flu plan was looking at flu. And so some of what would have been uh, perhaps in that plan, had it been looking more widely, was not there. What, what I was seeking to um, address was this notion, either in the flu plan or later in COVID, that there was simply an acceptance of a level of consequence. I think, I, forgive me, I can't remember the, the precise text in the, the 2011 flu plan, but I, I think there is commentary in it that reasonable worst-case scenario uh, are not necessarily things you accept. They, they don't take account of the countermeasures that you take to try to reduce that. Um, so either in that plan or in the eventual handling of COVID, I speaking from my own perspective, it was not simply a, here's a, a level of consequence that we accept that we can't do anything about. I, I do think, and this goes to your point about mass testing and contact tracing, the question, very legitimate, is could or should we have done more to put ourselves in the ability of, of suppressing? It is also the case that I don't think for any responsible government it can ever in a context like this, be either trying to suppress or dealing with the consequences. You have to do both. Um, and that is a feature of the planning as well. I'm going to put that over to Module 2A, Ms Sturgeon. Forgive me. But, but in relation, therefore, to the strategy, we appear to be agreed that the strategy, because it proclaimed its ability to be applicable to non-influenza pandemics, well, whilst it proclaimed its ability to be flexible and applicable to non-influenza pandemics, simply did not provide the thinking or the tools necessary to be able to deal with them. And I'm, I'm not asking you again about, and, and I'm not seeking your answer in relation to how the Scottish Government did respond and what its approach was once it was struck by the pandemic. But in terms of the strategizing, the planning and the preparedness at an overarching level, that thinking and the development of the necessary tools was absent from the sole strategy document that was meant to be applicable. I, I think that is fair, yes. Um, right. um, we're going to break. I'm sorry, we have oh, to yes. take a break every so often, Mr. Sturgeon, for the stenographer. Would that be a suitable? Uh, Very suitable, thank you, my lady. Right, I shall return at half past 11. All right.
So, Miss Sturgeon, having been harnessed to the 2011 strategy, Scotland was, of course, aware that that strategy was required to be refreshed or updated. And you were aware, are you not, that one of the work streams which was assigned to the Pandemic Flu Readiness Board in London and to the Pandemic Flu Preparedness Board in Edinburgh was the job of updating that strategy. And it never came to pass. That's correct. And you agree that the reason why it never came to pass was that it was one of the work streams which was recognised uh, to be necessary to be done. And because of the diversion of time, energy and resources to the necessary preparations for a no deal EU exit, it happened to be one of the, the work streams that was paused. Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, the prospect of a no deal Brexit and the work that was required across all of the UK governments uh, to plan for uh, Yellowhammer assumptions uh, meant that a significant amount of time, energy and resource was uh, diverted into that from a, a range of, of other matters and that was uh, certainly one of the work streams uh, that suffered from that. Um, we may come on to this, so I won't uh, go into detail right now. That is not to say there was not continued work uh, in the Scottish Government uh, to prepare for a pandemic, although, as we've already covered, much of that was in the context of a flu pandemic. As you've r rightly acknowledged, and, and as your then Director of Safer Communities Cabinet, I think, uh, no, Director of Safer Communities, Gillian Russell, accepts in her witness statement, a very significant amount of emergency planning time was spent on planning for a no deal EU exit and therefore something had to give. And one of the things that had to give was some of the work that, that, that um, was meant to be done for emergency planning. May we ask you, to what extent was that difficult decision, the diversion of resources, debated at cabinet level? It's, a, it's apparent from a large number of documentation that the necessary diversion was ventilated at, at administrative level, was acknowledged and accepted, and, and officials just had to get on with the job in hand with the resources that they had. But to what extent was that brought to your attention for the ultimate decision as to whether or not that diversion of resources away from emergency planning was appropriate. So I, I was very aware of the, the necessity to divert resources from other priorities to plan for uh, and uh, look at the, the potential for a no deal Brexit. Um, it, it wasn't the case, to the best of my memory, that somebody came to me and said, we need to divert resources from pandemic preparedness to this. But I would have known that there were many other aspects of emergency planning uh, that had resources diverted uh, for them. The Scottish Cabinet discussed uh, no deal Brexit, uh, Brexit generally, and the potential for a no deal Brexit on many different occasions. Uh, Brexit obviously was something that was happening completely against the, the will of the Scottish Government. So we were uh, not at all happy about uh, what we were having to do. But to put it bluntly, we had no choice because had a no deal Brexit happened and there were periods over uh, 2019 where that was a distinct possibility, the consequences of that would have been very, very severe. The, the planning assumptions in Yellowhammer were, were grim um, and extremely worrying. So we had no alternative but to do that work to the best of our ability. And we have limited resources. All governments have limited resources within emergency planning. We have within that limited uh, specialisms and skills in particular areas. So it stands to reason that with so much effort on that, there was going to be less resource available for other aspects of emergency planning. But resources were re-diverted from a number of different parts of the Scottish Government. It, it wasn't, I imagine, that resources were only re-diverted from civil contingency planning. No. You had to find the resource and the time and the energy from somewhere in order to be able to do the necessary preparations for a no-deal exit. There was 
probably not, and forgive me if I'm slightly oversimplifying this here, but there would not be many, if any, areas of Scottish Government work that uh, were not impacted uh, by the, the planning for, a, for Brexit generally and, and a no-deal Brexit. So in health, other than emergency planning, a lot of resource and, and energy at looking at some of the supply chain disruptions, the, the consequences for the health service staffing of uh, ending free movement across the European Union and education, obviously, with universities around uh, the education programme. So every part of our work was impacted by this, and it was a matter of deep and extreme regret and frustration for us at the time. The risk of a pandemic influenza was a tier one risk mm -hmm. in the United Kingdom government's risk register. Presumably, it was no less, no less greater risk in the Scottish risk register. It was the greatest. It was identified as the greatest risk facing the nation in the plethora of risks which any nation faces. So would you agree that the diversion of resource and money and time from that issue, that area of planning for the greatest risk which the country faced, the tier one influenza pandemic risk, was ultimately a, a false economy because although The consequences of a no deal EU exit would have been extremely serious and had to be mitigated. The one area from which it really couldn't be said that resources should sensibly be drawn would be the no less significant area of pandemic preparedness. I don't disagree with that. I think every aspect of Brexit has been false economy, if I can put it well, uh, mildly, but that's another Ms. issue Sturgeon. altogether. Ms. Ms. Sturgeon, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, that is a witness box, not a, a soapbox. Indeed. We, we, we cannot allow Indeed. the political debate of Brexit Indeed. to be ventilated here. With respect, I, I think you're asking me questions here that are very germane to the whole issue. Um, so, yes, I think it was um, deeply regrettable that resources had to be uh, diverted from any other area of work, and in particular, uh, pandemic uh, preparedness. Um, I also, though, would repeat a point I made earlier on that it was certainly from the Scottish Government perspective, it was not the case that all uh, preparation around uh, the potential for a pandemic stopped. I uh, would imagine you will ask me later in the session about exercise Silver Swan. That yes. was one of the key uh, elements of work and different work strands uh, out of that, of course. So all of that was, was deeply serious. The point I'm making is that we had little alternative but to do that. The consequences of a no-deal Brexit um, compared to what we faced with COVID, of course, pale into insignificance. But at the time, looking at the yellow hammer assumptions, uh, had they come to pass, they would have been severe. We were talking about availability of food and you know, the, the shops and medicines for the, the National Health Service. So we had no choice but to do that planning. I deeply regret any implications that had for our emergency planning in other areas. Thank you. That's very clear. Just turning now to the, the broad issue of the relations between Scotland and Westminster in terms of preparedness planning. Many of the recommendations which had come out of the Hine review to which you referred earlier, insofar as Scotland was concerned and the, devolved, and the other devolved administrations, revolved around the, the need for a proper framework for communication, both at CMO level, the Chief Medical Officer level, and the DCMO level, the need for perhaps a health forum across the United Kingdom in which there could be a proper informed debate at that level about pandemic preparedness, and also, of course, between the civil services of, of, of the devolved administrations. To what extent do, do you believe that the working relationships in relation to pandemic preparedness worked across the, the, the devolved administration and UK level? I think they worked reasonably well in, in general terms. I think they remained too ad hoc and 
didn't become, as the, the Hine review would have recommended, more embedded in a very systemic way. I know, uh, and this was certainly true uh, at the outset of COVID, the, the working relationship between the four CMOs was, was very good and, and very strong, and Scotland's CMO at the time fed uh, lots of uh, information um, and thinking from those discussions into the decisions we were taking. I think discussions and relationships between health ministers would vary, I think, in, from my perspective over the years, often as will sometimes be the case, depend on the individuals concerned, uh, which is more of a feature when they are ad hoc arrangements rather than embedded. Overall, though, I think in the context of intergovernmental relations, uh, work around in swine flu and from swine flu leading up to the beginning of COVID, I, I think, relatively speaking, they worked well. Presumably, an informal system of communication depends too much on personal inclination, personal relations, and perhaps ministerial whim as to whether or not the meetings take place. Mm. Did you ever get to the point where you, where you believed that there had to be a significant effort made to formalise those working relationships, or, or did it never get to that state? Um, I, I think it frequently gets to that stage in various discussions, and in this context, um, yes, I think it would be better if we had... Uh, working relationships that were uh, more uh, systemised and embedded and that would then transcend different individuals. Uh, that said, processes will not work, however embedded they are, if they don't have good faith and the right mindset and attitudes behind them. So in terms of the working between the four nations in this context, or indeed any context, it's a combination of all of these things that is required, but certainly uh, more of a, an embedded structure that is then respected uh, by all of the governments at play, I think would be uh, a step in the right direction. Sturgeon, how do you get past, I don't know if you heard Jeremy Hunt come out with a brutally frank answer, which was that when he was Secretary of State for Health for, the UK, for, uh, here, for England and Wales, uh, for England, sorry, um, he um, found that party politics got in the way of the relationship between Ministers for Health and the various um, administrations. So I think that can happen, and I think it has happened. I also think it's possible to overstate uh, the, the extent to which that happens. In my experience, forgive me just briefly to go back to swine flu, I, uh, as Scottish Health Secretary uh, at the start of swine flu, uh, Alan Johnson was Health Secretary for England, then replaced by Andy Burnham. I had a very good working relationship with both of those and different political perspectives uh, at play there. So I think if the attitudes and the mindsets are correct, particularly in the context of a health emergency, political differences shouldn't get in the way. But of course, that is going to depend from time to time on the different personalities involved. And forgive me, uh, I'm not going to stray off the, the, the topic here, but inevitably that will be influenced. It shouldn't be, but it will be influenced by the wider political context at the time. And perhaps Brexit has a, a, an impact there in terms of setting the overall tone for some of these intergovernmental relationships. You lent your considerable authority to a review of United Kingdom and national intergovernmental relations, did you not? Uh, yes. Um, Post-COVID, uh, there, there is now a, a structure which provides, I think, for a, a devolved government's council for interministerial groups to, to meet. I think there's an interministerial standing committee or some, some sort of committee and a secretariat, intergovernmental relation secretariat. Do you know whether or not that committee structure has borne fruit yet? Is it something which, as First Minister, you attended whilst you were in office? Uh, those new arrangements are very much in their infancy and were even more in their infancy while I was still First Minister. So I think in, in many respects it remains to be seen the, the extent to which they improve uh, the, the overall uh, working relationship. I, I come back to a point I made earlier, I think systems and processes are really important, but they will only work if all of the parties participating in them uh, participate in the right spirit and attitude. And, and that in, in intergovernmental relations 
uh, is often where it, it breaks down. Um, and I've been, as First Minister, and for years before that as Deputy First Minister, involved in a range of different iterations, joint ministerial councils, these new arrangements. Um, and they will work if everybody around the table is there in the right spirit. Milady had evidence from Oliver Dowd and the Deputy Prime Minister about how, but both before, but, but, but I think boosted by the National Resilience Framework in its publication by the United Kingdom government in December 2022, there had been set up a, a UK resilience forum to discuss important issues relating to cross United Kingdom um, resilience and, and civil contingency arrangements. The Scottish Government attended the first UK Resilience Forum, as did um, UK Ministers, on the 14th of July 2021. But the Scottish Government was absent. It's listed as an absent participant uh, in May 2022 and February 2023. So it missed, it has simply not attended two of the three UK Resilience Forum meetings. Do you happen to know why that is so? I, I, I don't know for certain that it is the case. I, I appreciate your read, but I, I understand there may be some dubiety about whether we were in fact present on one of these occasions, but that's not something I can answer for you with certainty. Well, you were uh, present on right. the first meeting. Uh, the Scottish Government's the present. I personally wasn't yes. present. I understand from my own colleagues that there is some uh, uncertainty as to whether we were present uh, at the second one or not. I know the the minutes suggest that we weren't, but that's not an issue I can resolve for you right now. That resilience forum, I think, is um, is an important uh, opportunity for the, the four nations to come together. Its remit, uh, although again it's a, a forum in its relatively early stages, uh, seems to be similar to, perhaps not identical to the, the Scottish Resilience Partnership, which is also a strategic overview. So certainly the ability to have a, U, a Four Nations Forum that our own uh, mm. operations can feed into is certainly a useful one. I cannot answer why the Scottish Government, uh, uh, I can get that information for you, I can't answer here why we weren't present, if indeed we weren't present, but that is something I certainly uh, would encourage uh, ministers now to take part in. Thank you. The, the minutes, I should say, both the 3rd of May 2022 and 23 do state in terms that the can, Scottish Government was wholly absent. Can I, can I say, I'm not, I wasn't questioning that particular right. point. Now, the exercises, Silver Swan, Cygnus and, and Iris, the exercise Cygnus uh, exercise what well, was a United Kingdom exercise delivered by Public Health England. It wasn't therefore focused centrally on Scotland. Scotland played an important part and, and attended it and, and members of the Scottish Government were, were present during the exercise itself. Do you recall whilst First Minister debate about the extent to which the recommendations from Exercise Cygnus had been implemented. There is evidence, I should say before my lady, that on a UK level, many of the recommendations were, by the time of COVID, not implemented wholly. Some were in part implemented, some were not implemented at all, mm -hmm. some were complete. What was the position with Scotland? As I understand, so you, the first part of your question, would I have had an awareness? I would have had a general awareness of exercises and uh, the Scottish Government working to implement recommendations that were relevant to us. I, I wouldn't have been uh, closely involved on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with that uh, in, in detail. My understanding is that of the, I think, 22 recommendations out of Exercise Cygnus, uh, the Scottish Government assessed all of them for their applicability or relevance to Scotland. Yes. Um, and I believe at the time uh, COVID uh, struck us, there were uh, 14 of those complete and, and eight outstanding. Um, some of those would have been for the UK government to take the lead on. I, I believe one on social care was paused by the UK government uh, due to Brexit, something we've already discussed. There was another 
around pandemic uh, guidance that the UK government was to take the lead on, but uh, that hadn't been progressed. I think the other point I would make about this is, in, in relation to both those uh, recommendations that I've mentioned, there would have been analogous recommendations in Silver Swan uh, that Scotland was pursuing. So on yes. uh, social care, there was a recommendation there about social care contracts, business continuity that we had considered complete and in terms of pandemic guidance with one exception uh, which was uh, updated guidance for health and social care that had been out for consultation at the end of 2019 uh, but other than that the recommendations in Silver Swan for updating guidance had uh, been taken forward. In relation to exercise Iris that was a one-day exercise was that a, a tabletop exercise? Yes it was. And that was a Scottish exercise Yes. in, in March of uh, 18. Was that the exercise that was concerned with an assumed outbreak of MERS? Yes. And what, Ms Sturgeon, was the outcome of that exercise in terms of the implementation of recommendations? Uh, that was very much ongoing at the time uh, COVID struck. Obviously, that exercise was the, the latest of the three that we're referring to right now, I, I think, took place in... 2018, there were, I think, of the 13 recommendations in it, there were uh, four that had been completed, a number, uh, two, I think, that were ongoing, and then some others uh, were paused when COVID uh, came along uh, for, when we look at some of them, for understandable reasons, because yes. the system was dealing with a real pandemic at that time, and it would not have made sense to go forward uh, in a separate track with the, uh, the recommendations from IRIS. But IRIS is... Uh, partly because of when it happened is the one where at the outset of COVID there were most of the recommendations uh, still outstanding or more than in the other exercises. I think it's fair to say, Ms Sturgeon, that there were no single work streams which were of great importance, which were wholly uncompleted. So although there were, I think, three areas where work had not been completed, mm -hmm. other aspects of those work streams had been completed. Are, are, are you still referring to exercise iris? Yes. Yes. So in relation to, I think, updating guidance in relation to MERS-CoV, which obviously is not of great um, significance, perhaps, in terms of dealing with uh, COVID, certain work to do with readying NHS boards to deal with the potential impact of contact tracing and community sampling during a HCID outbreak, and also finishing off the fit testing for particular types of PPE. Were those the broad areas that were still outstanding? Uh, yes, that is correct. And some of the, the PPE recommendations around fit testing uh, initially came from uh, Silver Swan, but there were similar recommendations out of uh, Exercise Iris as well. And then coming back to Silver Swan, which I acknowledge it was before Iris, but, but the reason I'm coming to that last is for the importance of one of the work streams which which came out of Silver Swan. The, I think of the, the, the 17 recommendations, 13 were considered by the Scottish Government to be complete, but an important area was pandemic guidance for the health and social care sector. Was that ever completed, even though Silver Swan was in 2015? The specific uh, guidance for health and social care had not been completed. It was out for consultation uh, at the end of 2019 um, and therefore hadn't been finalised and signed off. The recommendation in Exercise Silver Swan around uh, pandemic guidance, though, incorporated more than that, that one piece of guidance uh, and all of the other uh, aspects uh, that we took forward had been completed. So NHS standards for organisational resilience uh, had been uh, published and reviewed, guidance on dealing with mass fatalities, uh, guidance on death certification, uh, pandemic flu guidance for infection prevention and control, and pandemic flu communications guidance. These other bits of guidance uh, had been completed. The, the one outstanding part was the uh, response and guidance documentation for health and social care, which was still at the consultative stage. Yes. That was an important part of Silver Swan. It wasn't complete by the time of virus, and it wasn't complete by the time of COVID four years later. That's correct. All right.
And is that primarily why the Auditor General of Scotland, uh, who reported in February 2021 in the report NHS in Scotland 2020, to the effect that the Scottish Government could have been better prepared to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, it based its initial response on the 2011 strategy, which we've debated, but did not fully implement improvements identified during subsequent pandemic preparedness exercises. It was that issue of the, the failure to complete the work done in the adult social care sector that led to that conclusion. Um, I, I wouldn't want to speak for the Auditor General in um, saying what led uh, to those conclusions, I would say my view would be that that would have been part of it. I think the, well, I know there were other uh, issues raised in the Audit Scotland report that you refer to around PPE, PPE availability and, and distribution. So I, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would agree that was the only issue that led to those conclusions, but certainly it would have been one of them. Uh, perhaps for completeness, I should say that that Audit Scotland report also did comment that the Scottish Government responded quickly uh, to COVID when it uh, confronted us. Ms Sturgeon, that is, of course, is a, an issue of response with which you and I are both aware we're not addressing. We're dealing with preparedness. I may have been a little unfair because paragraph 46 of that same report concludes, as a priority, the Scottish Government should update and publish national pandemic guidance for health and social care from which we deduced that that was the error that was outstanding. Has that guidance now been published? Do you know? I do not believe that has yet been published, but uh, you forgive me, I've not been in the Scottish Government for uh, a few months now. Uh, there, and I think the Audit Scotland report reflected this, there is a real importance in ensuring that that guidance, which had been out for consultation before COVID, fully reflects the learning from COVID. But, Ms Sturgeon, that report was issued in February 2021. You ceased being First Minister on the 28th of March of this year. During that elapse of two years while you were First Minister, was that national guidance for the health and social care sector published? Uh, no. Um, I, again, I, I can only give uh, an opinion here. I think, from my experience, uh, to have published guidance uh, without properly assessing some of the lessons. We also uh, commissioned and established a, a standing committee on pandemic preparedness. And I think it is important that the health service in, in Scotland, as I'm sure is the case in the other nations of the UK, has lots of guidance that it operates within and that it takes cognizance of. In terms of pandemic guidance, I think it is really important that there is a a proper fulsome exercise to incorporate properly the, the granular as well as some of the strategic learning from the, the COVID pandemic. And to conclude, the reference to which you've just made about a standing committee, is that the Standing Committee on Pandemic Preparedness, which is a, a permanent advisory group which you commissioned, yeah. it now sits permanently comprising scientists, experts, the CMO, the Deputy CMO and others, to make recommendations for the, the better promotion of pandemic preparedness in Scotland? Yes. And has that already, has that committee already issued an interim report, I think it did so in August last year, making recommendations about various aspects of pandemic preparedness? It issued an interim report that I responded to while I was still First Minister. I, I think it made three interim recommendations, uh, one, uh, proposing a, a centre for pandemic preparedness, another relating to the, the data and analytics uh, infrastructure that we have and in its view should develop in Scotland, um, and a third around how we build and strengthen scientific advisory networks both within Scotland and across the UK and link into international uh, organisations as well. It is uh, due in coming months to publish a more substantive report with uh, longer term recommendations, as I understand it. And there was a fourth, continued innovation in the sciences and public health research. My, forgive me, I, that was the third one I was referring to. Um, forgive me if, if that was a fourth and I've missed the third one. That's all right. Ms mm -hmm. Turgeon, thank you very much. Milady, would you give me one moment?
I think I've given provisional permission to Scottish COVID bereaved to ask a question. My lady has I it. confirm permissions granted. Mr. Anwar. Good afternoon, Ms. Sturgeon. I have a handful of questions left to ask on behalf of the Scottish COVID bereaved. In your evidence earlier, you readily accepted there was a gap in terms of the pandemic you were ultimately dealing with, but that, that, but that did not mean the plan had no utility at all. So I'm going to refer you to the joint expert report that was provided, prepared for this inquiry on health inequalities for module one by a Professor Sir Michael Marmo and Professor Claire Bambra. I refer you specifically to inquiry 00019-5843, page 0064, paragraph 149. I'm not going to take you through it, uh, but to summarize, he concluded that with some exceptions, the specialist structures concerned with the risk management and civil emergency planning did not properly consider societal, economic and health impacts in light of pre-existing inequalities and the UK government and the devolved administrations. And relevant public health bodies did not systematically or comprehensively assess pre-existing social and economic inequalities and the vulnerabilities of different groups during a pandemic in their planning for risk assessment processes. So, Ms Sturgeon, the question is, do you accept that this analysis would also apply to the Scottish Government in their pandemic planning? Um, in broad terms, yes, I would. Um, I don't think uh, that we sufficiently, um, to use the terms there, systematically or comprehensively um, assessed social economic health inequalities and therefore uh, how we dealt with them in the context of a, a pandemic. So I, I think I would accept that. Again, I don't think it is right to go from there to say there was no planning and no thought uh, given to that. There, I, I, again, I won't repeat it. I think some of this is, is narrated in the expert report that you're quoting uh, to me, the work that the Scottish Government had done starting, uh, again, when I was Health Secretary, around the equally well work culminating uh, in April 2020 in the establishment of Public Health Scotland, which is actually, in an organisational sense, uh, one of the initiatives intended to build that systemic and comprehensive approach to, uh, in particular, health inequalities into our planning work. Thank you. The second question is, to what extent, if any, did the Scottish Government carry out an equalities and human rights assessment of its pandemic preparedness plans? Um, if I can answer in summary there and, and uh, offer uh, to, to seek more information to be provided, because it, it is a, a question that would involve uh, looking at lots of different aspects of, of planning. The Scottish Government uh, does and will have carried out different impact assessments uh, of different aspects of, of our planning, uh, both in, in preparedness and then as we went into the, the response uh, phase to COVID. Uh, I don't have all of the detail of that in front of me right now, but I can, uh, through uh, those in the Scottish Government, seek to have that provided if that is helpful. Uh, thank you. That would be helpful and we would be seeking that information, asking the inquiry to seek that information. And the third question, Ms Sturgeon, is to what extent, if any, were those plans assessed as to how they would affect the various protected characteristics in terms of the Equality Act 2000? For example, age, disability, maternity, race, religion, sex and sexual orientation, amongst others. So again, um, apologies if I'm repeating myself, uh, that would have been part of impact assessments that would be carried out routinely on uh, Scottish Government work and planning. Again, I will have to get you more detail of that in terms of the, the sort of granular information. Uh, I, again, I am moving uh, into the, the, the response phase here, but you will be aware, I'm sure, one of the things we did early on in the response phase was to set up a um, an expert group on uh, ethnic uh, minority inequalities in order that as we went through the response phase, we could uh, make sure that we were adapting uh, appropriately there. But uh, in terms of the detail of the impact assessments and protected characteristic assessments, I, uh, as I say, I will uh, seek to, if the inquiry would find it helpful, to have more information passed to it.
that, that would be helpful. Those are the ends of my questions. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Mr. Sturgeon. Uh, it would be helpful if you could provide that information, Mr. Sturgeon. Can I just check? Were you saying that it's your understanding that impact assessments routinely included consideration of protected characteristics? I, for, forgive me, my lady, I, I wouldn't want to, um, to to leave you with that. I'm, I'm not sure that that would not be an overstatement. So again, I think the information I'm offering to have provided uh, through the offices of the Scottish Government would answer that question for you. Um, certainly, that would be involved in impact assessments, but I, I wouldn't want to attach uh, more uh, relevance to the word routinely than I feel confident to give you right now. Thank you very much. My lady, rather than setting um, too great a hair running, it, it may help Mr Anwar, um, if my lady recalls for him, that the evidence of Miss Lamb yesterday included a, a, a section dealing with the consideration by Scotland of health inequalities. And my lady will recall that there was a, in the course of evidence, she referred to the Auditor General for Scotland's report on health inequalities 2012, equally well 2013, the NHS Health Scotland's Health Inequalities Policy Review 13, and then five public health reports between 2013 and 2022, which therefore provide the basis, along with the Public Sector Equality Duty and the Equality Act 2010, for the consideration of health inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Sturgeon. That's Thank all you. for today. Um, next time we meet, I suspect, will be in Scotland. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, my lady. The next witness is John Swinney. I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth Mr Swinney may I begin by thanking you for the assistance that you've so far given to the inquiry um, you have provided a witness statement, um, which we can see at 185352. Thank you. And can we go to page 15, please? Can you confirm, Mr Swinney, that um, that is signed by you on the 5th of May of this year, and it's true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It, that is the case, yes. Thank you very much. May we have permission to publish? Sir. Thank you, my lady. We can take that down. Mr Swinney, you held the position of Deputy First Minister in the Scottish Government from November of 2014 until March of this year, is that right? That is correct, yes. You began your political career as a Westminster MP for the Tayside North constituency uh, from May of 1997, and you were then a member of the Scottish Parliament, first for North Tayside constituency from 1999 to 2011, and then for the Perthshire North constituency from 2011. Yeah, that is all correct, yes. You also held the roles of Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Sustainable Growth in the Scottish Government from May 2007 to May 2016, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills from May 2016 to May 2021, and Cabinet Secretary for COVID Recovery from May 2021 to March 2023. Is that all correct? That is all correct, yes. Thank you. I'd like to begin by asking you, please, about your ministerial responsibility for resilience. 
uh, because as Deputy First Minister over the nine-year period, that was very much part of your portfolio, wasn't it? That's correct, yes. What was the scope of ministerial resilience? Before I answer the question, would it be possible, Milady, for me perhaps just to express at the outset of my evidence my sympathy to everyone affected by COVID uh, and for the suffering that has been experienced and also my appreciation to members of the public and our public service personnel who have done so much uh, along with colleagues in the private and third sectors to sustain recovery. In relation to uh, the question, uh, my responsibility for resilience was held um, essentially as uh, an ultimate point of um, responsibility. Uh, I consider myself to be in the government responsible for resilience matters, accountable to the First Minister. And it was my role to make sure that Scotland had in place um, effective resilience arrangements. Now, that didn't mean that I did everything, because in one of the introductions to the Scottish Risk Assessment, for example, I make the point that resilience has got to be everybody's business. So all aspects of government have to think through what are the resilience risks that are faced in their area of responsibility. But it was my responsibility to make sure that all of that was in as strong a position as it could be for um, any eventuality that we had to face. Given that this was but one portfolio of, of many that you would have had your eyes across uh, as in the role of um, Deputy First Minister, do you feel that you had sufficient time to be able to devote to the, the subject of resilience? Life was always pretty hectic, to be honest, uh, in all of the ministerial responsibilities that I carried out. Um, but I did feel I had adequate opportunity to provide the strategic leadership to resilience issues that were required. But I stress that wasn't a responsibility that meant I had to do everything. I was providing the direction, the strategy, the approach to be taken, but obviously motivating colleagues and all the relevant aspects of the Scottish Government and our partners around the country to make sure that they were preparing properly. Right. The, the, the reason that I ask you that question is, uh, and you may be aware that the inquiry has heard from Sir Oliver Letwin, who gave evidence to my lady that there would be a benefit in his view of uh, the UK government having a senior cabinet level minister solely devoted full time to a, a resilience portfolio. Do you think that that is necessary uh, within Scottish Government? I think it's a reasonable proposition and one that, 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 that is worthy of consideration because uh, I think we are, if I look back on my ministerial career, um, I spent 16 years as a minister and I dealt with quite a number of resilience incidents uh, across a whole range of different responsibilities and sectors. Uh, so, uh, and as I look at some of the factors that are now affecting society, issues around about climate, for example, I only think that resilience issues are going to become ever more significant and prescient. And looking at some of the evidence that Melody has heard in relation to the, 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 the scenarios that can be faced uh, as the world changes, uh, you know, as population rises, as climate change has its effect, there may well be a strong argument for the proposition that Sir Oliver Letwin has put forward. I want to now ask you about a series of bodies and committees that were set up uh, either just before or during your time in office. Uh, and I want to begin with the Cabinet Subcommittee on Scottish Government Resilience, also known as CSC SCORE, I think. Um, now, the role of this particular committee was to give ministerial oversight to strategic policy and guidance in the context of resilience in Scotland. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And this committee met in preparation for emergency response and in order to keep abreast of matters related to promoting and improving civil protection and also preparing for special contingencies such as pandemic influenza. 
It was set up some considerable time ago, and indeed the last recorded meeting of it took place on the 14th of April of 2010. Now, I want to go to those meeting notes, please, which are at 102935, thank you. And we can see the date there, and present are yourself and also Nicholas Sturgeon. And if we scroll down, please, we can also see um, others present, some of whose names have been redacted. Um, let's go, please, to page 7, and I'd like to look at paragraphs 11 and 12. Now, of course, if we remind ourselves that 2010 was just after we had suffered the swine flu outbreak, we can see at paragraph 11 somebody present introduced a paper which analysed the implications of the lessons identified from the recent emergencies for the Scottish Government's role in coordinating national emergency responses. He said that the requirement for SCORE to be activated had greatly increased over the last three years, which included activation for the fuel shortages in 2008, the flu pandemic, that's the swine flu pandemic, and an increasing number of weather-related incidents. Scottish Resilience would shortly undertake a significant review of SCORE's capacity and its capability to support enhanced national decision-making in the light of the lessons learned, and this would include options for improvements in accommodation, IT, training and staffing. Could we scroll down, please? He said that the lessons learned would also provide an opportunity to develop SCORE as a national emergency information analysis and decision-making hub, which was in line with the shared services agenda and national performance framework. It was planned to have discussions with COSLA, ACPOS and the Chief Fire Officers Association Scotland on the option of co-locating mutual aid coordination centres for police, fire and local authorities with SCORE. Such coordination would enable organisations to share resources and allow for a more streamlined approach to the collection and analysis of information. Thank you. We don't need to read in any further. So th this was a committee which, as of April 2010, um, not only was active and had been activated because of the, the national issues that had arisen, fuel shortages, pandemic, swine flu, uh, and also issues with climate change, but it was also very much looking forward to providing uh, a level of service um, in terms of what was being anticipated. Do you agree uh, that, as far as this meeting was concerned, it very much looked as if the committee was going to be busy? Uh, yes, uh, and the, the work that flowed from that over a number of years, I think, demonstrates exactly that point. So why, why was this the last occasion upon which this, miti this committee met? Essentially, what the, the, the work that was all envisaged in the paragraphs that have been read into the record was all work that was then taken forward, but not with the um, necessity of the supervision of that particular committee. Um, we essentially developed structures which had um, which involved the creation of a Scottish Resilience Partnership, which in a sense was living out the point that I made in one of my earlier answers, which was that resilience had to be everybody's business. So we needed to have a range of different organisations very much engaged in the preparation of uh, active resilience functions, many of which are listed in those paragraphs 11 and 12 that have been read. So that work was taken forward through the Scottish Resilience Partnership. Uh, there was direct ministerial involvement in that. I would have attended a number of Scottish Resilience Partnership meetings to provide the strategic ministerial direction. Um, and obviously, in the course of a range of different other incidents, because after 2010, we would have a number of other resilience um, incidents in which we were actively involved, um, we would essentially develop that working practice. I, I understand your answer that the work was taken forward by other bodies, um, but you will understand that the UK government had an equivalent committee called the NSCTHRC, or the Threats Committee, that didn't meet in person between 
2013 and 2017, and then it didn't meet in person thereafter. The inquiry has heard that evidence already. Do you think that there is value now in this sort of committee being reconvened um, and regularly meeting in order to ensure that these matters are kept very much within the forefront of ministers' minds? My, my first response is to say that I, I, I do genuinely feel that these issues are very much at the forefront of ministers' minds. I, I, I can say to um, my lady in the inquiry, you know, th these issues have kept me awake at night for many, many years on different questions, whether it's about winter weather incidents or about the pandemic flu. So they're very much issues that have been under um, active management and handling by ministers with active engagement on a proactive basis to identify threats and risks, because that's what led to the production of the Scottish Risk Assessment for the first time in 2018, which was to try to calibrate the risks that we might face. Um, but there may well be the need for a, a particular forum to look um, periodically, formally, in a recorded fashion, uh, to take stock about where preparations happen to be. I think one of the reasons why we felt this committee didn't need to meet was that if I go back to the attendance list at that meeting that you cited from 2010, that was all, all members of the cabinet were present there, apart from the then first minister. Uh, so you know, we had cabinet meeting on a weekly basis, which allowed us to conduct some of these issues as well. All right, thank you. Um, I next want to ask you about the Scottish Resilience Partnership, which you've just mentioned. The first issue it is to make sure that um, I'm addressing it by its correct title because when I suggested yesterday to Gillian Russell who set up the committee that it was called the Scottish Resilience Partnership she corrected me and said it was called the Strategic Resilience Partnership w which is it please well, uh, the, 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 the risk of contradicting a civil servant um, <laughs> it is in my view the Scottish Resilience Partnership but it has a strategic remit if that ah, perhaps helps right, to, well, to perhaps, build the bridge that's, that, that's where the, uh, the difficulty arose. Um, but in any event, th this was set up during um, your time in office, yep. but it was restricted, wasn't it, to Category 1 responders. Do you think that that was, in, in hindsight, perhaps too narrow uh, a remit? Do you think it should have been extended to, to other bodies um, uh, beyond Category 1 responders? I, I I, I don't think so, but I, but I wouldn't rule out the necessity to look at this question. I, I think it's important to, to look at who those Category 1 responders are. So around the table of the Scottish Resilience Partnership would be the leadership of Scotland's 32 local authorities, the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, the Chief Fire Officer of the Fire and Rescue Service, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, um, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Ambulance Service, um, and the, the, there will be others that I haven't managed to remember uh, off the top of my head. So they would be representing a very broad cross-section of those who would have to deliver the resilience response. And crucially, we'd have to make sure that appropriate preparations were being undertaken at a more local level, whether that was across the three regional resilience partnership areas in Scotland or the 32 local resilience partnerships representing each of the local authority areas. So that body had to consider what might future threats be, and they had to make sure that we were developing the processes and the infrastructure that would enable us to handle any such circumstance should an issue arise. How often were ministers involved in or in attendance at these meetings? It, quite frequently. Um, I, I, I certainly remember being personally at a number of these resilience partnership meetings um, and that was to essentially that attendance was to provide the direction of ministerial thinking so we would be considered I can remember contributing to those discussions around a range of issues some of which would be about um, pandemic flu some would be about winter weather some would be about cyber security, for example, which would be you know, a number of the, the very live and topical issues that we'd be discussing. 
In your witness statement to the inquiry, you say at paragraph 9, in the period running up to January 2020, the preparations for a pandemic were taken forward in Scotland as a combination of participation in the Four Nations activity across the UK and specific applications of this approach to the distinctive health and social care arrangements that reflected the devolved governance arrangements and that the approach of the Scottish Government would be best summed up as a pragmatic way of cooperating on a Four Nations basis. How do you say, Mr Swinney, that there was pragmatic cooperation between Scotland and the United Kingdom Government in terms of preparation? I think there would be examples of that would be uh, collaboration around um, some of the expert advice that would be available. So, for example, um, there would be representatives from Scotland that would take part in uh, organisations such as SAGE, for example. So and NERVTAG. And NERVTAG. Yes. And we would gather um, expert information and advice to inform our own uh, thinking within Scotland. So, uh, I would cite that as an example of where we weren't trying to replicate what would be a very good and strong source of um, scientific advice and professional advice to government. Uh, there would be cooperation around um, some aspects of procurement um, in relation to um, PPE, uh, I think I, I recall. So, uh, and then there would be other dialogue on a four nation basis where it, the, the, there really was no particular value in us um, undertaking a different and distinctive uh, uh, process. All right. Well, we're going to come on and, and look at some of those. But whatever the political point that could be made about the, the devolved administrations and their, their connection and the strength of their connection to the United Kingdom government, the, the truth is that pandemic planning was and ought to have been UK-wide uh, as an effort, shouldn't it, with each nation performing a role in a collective endeavour to prepare for a pandemic? Uh, I would say that, yes. So I don't want to, to dwell upon it because the, the inquiry has heard evidence from several witnesses now about this, but I'm sure you will accept, Mr Swinney, that the UK influenza preparedness strategy of 2011 should have been updated prior to COVID hitting, but wasn't updated. I've, I've obviously heard that evidence, yes. And, and were you aware at the time when you were in office that there were plans afoot to update it, but those plans, in fact, never came to fruition? I wouldn't say I was specifically aware of that particular point, no. Um, you are aware, though, that a, a, a pandemic flu preparedness board was set up yes. following the exercise Cygnus recommendations. And one of the aspects of, of work for that board was to update the strategy. That work was eventually paused because of um, preparations for a no-deal EU exit. Is it a source of regret for you, Mr Swinney, that on your watch that preparedness strategy was not updated? Yeah, obviously, I, I would, um, in all circumstances, have preferred to be able to achieve all of the, um, the commitments that were given to um, update material and to prepare accordingly. I think there's very strong evidence of pandemic preparations in the strategies that were taken forward and in the work that was undertaken, particularly within um, the, uh, the, the, the health team within the Scottish Government that led on, pan on pandemic preparation for that to be the case. But there's obviously aspects of work which have suffered as a consequence of what are the, in my experience, the inevitable congestion of multiple priorities that can often exist. And, and as the inquiry will have heard, um, the uh, preparations for a no-deal Brexit were a very real threat which had to be addressed and, as a consequence, some aspects of the work that was necessary to be undertaken for other areas of activity was not able to be completed. Can I suggest, in addition to that, though, there appears to have been a sluggishness within the Scottish Government to implement 
aspects of not only um, the exercise um, Cygnus recommendations, but also those that had come from exercise Silver Swan in 2016 and exercise Irish, Iris in 2018. Because yesterday, um, during the evidence of uh, Gillian Russell, we looked at some of the minutes from the Pandemic Flu Preparedness Board from June of 2019. And some of the comments within those minutes expressed a surprise at how slow matters were progressing. And in addition to that, we've heard this morning from Nicola Sturgeon that so far as guidance for health and social care is concerned, there was a recommendation for that to be updated as far back as the exercise Silver Swan report in 2016. And she has confirmed to the inquiry this morning that when she left office in March of this year, that had still not been implemented. So, so that is guidance and recommendations from several years ago. Do you agree that that demonstrates an alarming sluggishness for the implementation of what are important recommendations? I, I think th there, th there is a significant amount of guidance available in relation to the preparation for and the handling of um, a pandemic. And that guidance um, would be shared with, um, uh, with health boards uh, who would carry the responsibility for many of the actions that would be envisaged in such a plan. The question, so there would be an, an element of guidance that would be available there was perhaps a, well, there is, is a requirement from the commitments given here for that to be strengthened and, and advanced. So it wasn't that there was no guidance available, it's that perhaps updates were not provided uh, in a timious period for that. Seven years? So, yes. No, but, guide, no, no update within seven years to that guidance. But there would be other work that would be undertaken through the successive exercises between Silver Swan, Cygnus and Iris, which would be helping the learning within different organisations as those um, exercises took their course and as professionals saw the sequence of events that were being under, that, 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 that were unfolding. So there was a, a source of information to assist in the strengthening of guidance, but the final material was available for consultation around about the time when the COVID pandemic struck. All right. It, it, it's, it, it doesn't give the impression that, that those recommendations uh, were, were being speedily addressed, does it? There's a lot of work being undertaken, but I think what I would have to concede is that there are multiple priorities that uh, are difficult to wrestle with within government. And, and I, I've, I, I don't want to, to, to labour the point, but other events come along that unfortunately slow things up and no deal Brexit is one example, there would be other incidents that would happen, there would be other events that would happen in the sequence of events that perhaps would mean that uh, all the timetables we wanted to complete were not able to be completed uh, as we would wish. From your perspective Mr Swinney, what was the impetus and purpose behind a Scottish risk assessment being um, implemented? Uh, I would say its purpose was to, to take the, the learning that we had from the UK-wide risk assessment and to ensure that the, it, it was tailored in any way that was appropriate for it to be tailored to the specific circumstances within Scotland. Now, that would be more relevant on some of the challenges we would face in relation to um, winter weather, for example, which would be perhaps a more acute challenge for us than other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, but its purpose and its objective was to be complementary to the United Kingdom National Risk Assessment. Right. Can we put up, please, the Scottish Risk Assessment for 2018? It's at 102940. Thank you. And if we look to page three... Thank you. We can see your smiling face there, Mr Swinney. <laughs> Together with, if we look on the right-hand column, uh, your personal feelings about the implementation of this 
assessment. I feel very strongly that resilience is everyone's business. Our combined efforts to protect our society are the test of our resilience. The ongoing safety and security of our communities is the measure of our success. Building a shared understanding of the risks we face in Scotland is vital if we are to do this successfully. Does, does that accurately depict how you felt at the time that this was implemented? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, I don't want to, uh, again, c cover evidence that the inquiry has already heard, but you will, I think, agree, Mr Swinney, that so far as risk assessments are, are concerned, there is a risk assessment for um, pandemic influenza and there are risk assessments for um, high consequence uh, infectious diseases, but nothing in between. And the evidence that the inquiry has heard is that consideration should be given to multiple scenarios or a spectrum of risks and that, and that going forwards, the risk assessments both nationally and also uh, within the devolved administrations should concentrate on, on, on a much wider variety of what those risks should be. I think that's a reasonable point. Um, I think the, in the compilation of the Scottish Risk Assessment, um, an effort was put in to try to ensure that we addressed the range of circumstances that we might face. And um, if my memory serves me right, I think in this risk assessment we identified and prioritised 10 within that report. Um, but obviously within that, there are a multiplicity of different scenarios on each and every one of those um, themes. So to go back to, 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 to this risk assessment, um, we would identify, I think we probably identified um, pandemic flu and winter weather as the two highest and most likely risks with the greatest degree of impact. Within those, there would be countless scenarios that might well be considered. And I think part of the challenge in all of this work is to be able to satisfactorily identify just how many scenarios it might be possible to consider and then whether to prepare for them because they will require a very different response. And of course, all of that stands to be very resource intensive in the process. Yes, or to have a plan that is flexible enough to, to deal with different levels of or, or, t or types of transmission and incubation periods and that sort of thing. The inquiry has also heard that there is a doctrinal issue with the way in which the reasonable worst case scenario is uh, unmitigated and encourages those planning for, for risks to plan for the consequences rather than for preventing them. Do you agree with that? I, th I think the, 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 the doctrinal approach in resilience, I think, is, is certainly focused on trying to um, mitigate the, the, the impact and to secure recovery as speedily as possible. But I don't think that does justice to the wider um, perspective within government, which lays, certainly in the Scottish government lays a very heavy emphasis on prevention. So we, you know, in, in so many aspects of um, Scottish government policy, there is an emphasis on early intervention and prevention to avoid um, damaging circumstances emerging, whether that's on policy questions such as um, child poverty or early learning and, and, and interventions. Um, but it, it has an application to um, some of the resilience questions as well. Well, I'd just like to, to look at a different document, please, in order to explore your answer to that question in a little more detail. Could we put up 87205, please? This is uh, a minute from the meeting of the Pandemic Diseases Capabilities Board uh, in April of 2022. So it's after the pandemic, but I'd like to just look at the analysis here of preparation in order to better inform us of, of how we really should be uh, considering uh, preparing for any future pandemic. And can we go to page four, please, and look at paragraph 16? 
Thank you. Further in line with the National Security Risk Assessment methodology, revised pandemic reasonable worst case scenario models represent unmitigated scenarios and so do not include a full risk assessment for the use of NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Given that the imposition of lockdown in part accounted for a 25% drop in GDP between February and April of 2020, the largest drop on record, and numerous secondary and tertiary impacts on all sectors, this represents a significant gap in the UK's assessment of pandemic risk. Noting that, even without government intervention, we would anticipate spontaneous behaviour change and subsequent economic damage. What is more, the secondary and tertiary aspects of these measures will have been unevenly spread throughout society, highlighting and in areas exacerbating pre-existing inequalities. If we can go to page five, please, and then look at recommendation 2.1. This recommendation is that all departments are to use... Oh, it's disappeared. Uh, no, it's recommendation 2.1, please. On page five, I think it's at the top. There we are, thank you. <laughs> All departments to use the outputs of recommendation two to produce a supplementary risk assessment to the NSRA that assesses the impacts of public behavioural changes on their sectors. The outputs of this work should be reviewed by ministers with a view to determining which behavioural changes fall within an agreed response ambition that will provide clear planning assumptions to enhance cross-government preparedness arrangements for future NPI deployment. And then if we can go down to read through paragraphs 18 to 20, please. The unprecedented use of NPIs and significant changes in public behaviour seen during the COVID-19 pandemic required the provision of far greater economic support than pre-COVID planning assumptions suggested. The planning assumptions in the 2011 UK influenza pandemic preparedness strategy focused on the economic impacts of sickness absences. As a result, the strategy did not include many of the significant economic impacts we have seen during this pandemic, such as the dramatic drops in economic activity, significant shifts and reductions in consumer spending, and disruption to global supply chains. The OBR's Fiscal Risks Report from July 2021 suggests the UK's real GDP declined by an unprecedented 9.8% unprecedented in 2020, and as of September 2021, the NAO, NAO estimated the lifetime cost of government spending on COVID-19 will reach £370 billion. Clearly then, in line with, with recommendation 2.1, our economic risk assessment for pandemics must be updated to include a broader range of impacts, including the significant potential impacts of MPIs and behavioural changes on different sectors of the economy. So not only was much of the planning and preparedness concerned with preparing for the reasonable worst case scenario, not preventing it from arising, but it would appear that planning was never really designed to deal with the fallout um, of any of the countermeasures that might be taken to prevent or cope with the reasonable worst case scenario. Do you agree? I, I think it's difficult to and this gets to the heart of um, so much of the assessment work that has got to be undertaken here, to um, identify what might well be the range of impacts that have to be wrestled with in, in, in any particular scenario. And then, of course, the more scenarios that we consider, the broader the range of variables that there will be. Um, but I think what the material that has been read, I think, fairly highlights is the very significant wider impact of uh, the pandemic and its effect on our society. And, you know, as I, we, and we, we, we may well come on to this in other modules of the inquiries at work, but, 
After we took the steps to, you know, the most immediate steps in, in March 2020 in relation to, um, to lockdown, um, I led a lot of work within government which was about trying to essentially reconcile much of this, in this information as to how we then worked our way back out of that and it became known as the, the Four Harms Framework where we looked at the direct COVID harm, the indirect COVID harm, the economic and the social harm that was being caused and how we evaluated what was the, the right amount of risk to, to, to wrestle with, I suppose, in terms of trying to get out of a situation uh, of lockdown. So in a sense, I, I offer that information to try to illustrate that the dilemmas that are involved very much in this material were dilemmas that we were wrestling with but I, but I would concede that we were wrestling with them after lockdown had yes. commenced, not before. But going forwards, what we've just read into to the record should become part of pandemic planning, shouldn't it? I would say it's, it, it, it needs to, yes. Mr Swinney, I'm afraid I'm not going to finish your evidence before the break, which we have to take in a couple of minutes. But before we do break, I'd just like to ask you one more question, because... You were Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Sustainable Growth for nine years. Um, what are your views on the fact that, as a result of what we've just discussed, there was no real financial pandemic planning put in place for support or countermeasures? Uh, if I answer that in relation to the context I was dealing in, which is within the Scottish Government, um, I, I suspect your question Ms Blackwell might be getting towards, well, why didn't you have a, a reserve to deal with these circumstances? And as I think a number of evidence um, uh, witness statements have provided this detail to the inquiry, that was not within my gift to create. The financial arrangements of devolution essentially required the Scottish Government to um, balance its budget on an annual basis. And any resources that are carried forward are only carried forward on a very limited basis from one financial year to the next. So we are specifically by the financial, the Scottish Government is specifically pre pre prevented from building up a reserve that it can deploy for eventualities of this type. Uh, that's a commentary on the existing financial arrangements that exist um, within the Scottish um, uh, within the Scottish Parliament. Now what I would um, Acknowledge, and I've acknowledged this publicly on many occasions, that the scale of the economic intervention made by the United Kingdom government um, in and around about March 2020 and thereafter was um, very welcome uh, from my perspective. Um, it saved you know, many people's livelihoods from you know, great jeopardy, um, but it is an illustration of the scale of the financial challenge that comes with a disruptive pandemic of this nature. All right, thank you very much. My lady, is that a convenient moment? Thank you very much. Sorry we can't complete you this morning, Mr Swinney. Uh, I shall return at quarter to two, please. All rise.
Blackwell. Thank you, my lady. Mr Swinney, the first topic I want to ask you about this afternoon is intergovernmental relations, which is something that was touched upon by Ms Sturgeon in her evidence this morning. And for you to confirm that in relation to the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004, there was a concordat between the United Kingdom government and Scottish ministers that was published in February of 2021 which was an agreed framework for cooperation between Scottish ministers and the UK government. Not a legally binding agreement, but uh, with an expectation that each party would abide by it wherever practicable. Is that right? I, I, it exists, yes, but I think the date is much earlier than 2021. Uh, did I say 20? I meant 2011. I'm yeah. so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad it, you picked me up it, on it's that. Early, it's, it, yes. Yeah, yes, yes. I, I think it may even be even earlier than that. Right. February of 2011 is the date that I have here, but we yeah, can I mean, I mean, I mean, In any event, it came into... It, it came into force. I use that word loosely because, of course, there was no legal binding nature um, attached to it, but an expectation that the Scottish ministers and the UK government would abide by it. And it if, if indeed from from um, before, if you think that the uh, the agreement might have um, might have extended back beyond that date, um, Scottish ministers agreed that certainly the spirit of the Civil Contingencies Act would be followed, and from that time, uh, Category One and Category Two responders were identified as um, indeed happened um, in England. Yes, yeah, so the, the the reason why I was just been a bit precise about the time scale is that I, I do have a, a concordat which was um, predates our government coming to office in 2007 so it must have followed I think sometime yes. soon after the passage of the Civil Contingencies Act in 2004, in 2004 yes. so those arrangements were off were already in place were already in place and um, they for example um, envisage the designation of, uh, they, don't, uh, envisage, they require the designation of an individual within the Scottish Government to be, at uh, 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 official level, a key resilience person, if I could use that terminology, and that was always followed through. So just, just so that I, I was clear about the, no, the, the document. Thank you very yeah. much. And in 2013, in fact, there was a memorandum of understanding and supplementary agreements between the United Kingdom government and all of the devolved nations with the intention of the devolution settlements enduring, having enduring qualities of good communication, etc., wasn't there? So, so, so there were these, these agreements in place from, from, I'm going to suggest, soon after devolution happened, which, which always uh, attempted to propel along a, a good-natured agreement and good communication between the nations. That's correct, yes. All right. But we know that after the onset of COVID and commissioned by the four heads of government, there was a review of intergovernmental relations. And we know that because a report was produced dated January of 2022, and I think that was referred to during this morning's session. Michael Gove, who will be coming to this inquiry to give evidence um, at a later date, who is currently Secretary of State for DLUC and Minister for Intergovernmental Relations, has told the inquiry in his written statement that at the time of the pandemic, it was apparent that the broader matter of intergovernmental relations was not clearly agreed. And there were difficulties encountered in relation to communication, but also matters of substance. Does the fact that the four heads of state commissioned the review of intergovernmental relations suggest that Michael Gove might be right, that the practical difficulties that were encountered when COVID hit in terms of communication and substance uh, indicated that, that further work needs to be done in terms of the way in which the nations work together in an emergency? I, I, I wouldn't say that... Um the uh, 
working arrangements in an emergency were particularly poor. Uh, I think there was generally a pretty good amount of cooperation when we were operating in an emergency. And, and in that respect, I'm going a, a way back to my period since 2007, where yes. generally when there was a difficulty um, and we were perhaps involved in a, a COBRA call, which is the UK emergency call, um, there would be you know, a lot of um, reasonable, practi practical engagement in an emergency context. But the reason why that um, process had to be undertaken to form an agreement about how we were all going to operate was that generally relationships between the administrations were pretty poor by that point. Poor in the aftermath of Brexit, because obviously constituent parts of the United Kingdom, um, well, we, we were, in Scotland, we were not happy with Brexit at all, or not happy with the, and you obviously had to spend a lot of time in the no deal Brexit, as the inquiry heard this morning from Nicola Sturgeon. Um, but generally, relations are pretty poor. All right. And, and, and therefore there was an, you know, a necessity to try to formulate some working basis upon which intergovernmental relationships could be improved. So moving forward in terms of preparing for future pandemics or future civil emergencies, any, any level of clarity as to how communications and matters of substance should be taken forwards between the four nations would be welcomed. Yes. Thank you. Just in case an eagle-eyed commentator spots, I think you, by a slip of the tongue, said four heads of state. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. Is that the heads of government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to move on now to ask you about the level of um, engagement, community engagement between the Scottish Government um, and local government and also the Scottish Leaders Forum. Yeah. Um, you tell us in your witness statement that uh, one of the hallmarks of the operating approach of Scottish Government during the period that this module is interested in <coughs> was to engage widely with other public authorities, public bodies, business and third sector organisations to create a sense of common purpose in your endeavour. And you tell us that that was achieved through forums such as the Scottish Leaders Forum, which brings together senior public sector leaders from across Scotland, has regular dialogue with major business representative organisations and interaction with a representative range of third sector organisations. Tell us how important the Scottish Leaders Forum and the interaction between government and those sectors is? Very important um, on all aspects of government policy. I think if I am um, not out of government, one of my big reflections is that one of the big problems of government is that um, government often operates within individual compartments and the necessity of cross responsibility working to try to sort common problems. You know, the problem of, of child poverty or of climate change will not be solved in one neat little compartment in government. It will involve a whole range of different organisations, as will any issue in relation to resilience, will invariably require a range of different organisations to be part of it. So what um, the governments in which I was a part tried to foster was a climate of collaboration, cooperation across different public and private sector boundaries, third sector boundaries. So Scottish Leaders Forum would bring together um, basically the key public sector, third sector, private sector leaders around the country to try to formulate common purpose and a, a common direction of travel in solving problems that um, we're all interested in solving, but might have slightly different perspectives about who could do what in the process. All right. In terms of um, emergency preparedness and pandemic planning, what level of engagement was there between the Scottish Government and the voluntary sector? Um, there would be dialogue through um, 
uh, you know, the, the, the routine conversations we would have with the third sector about you know, how they could perform um, a, a role within the delivery of policy. So if I think back to um, periods where um, you know, I had responsibility for third sector relationships, 2007 to probably about 2012, you know, we'd be regularly involving the third sector in the formulation of strategy, what role they could perform, how they could be involved. When it got to the stage of um, dealing with the pandemic, third sector organisations would be operating very closely with uh, local resilience partnerships because you know, we would encourage, we actually not just encourage, but we funded um, what are called third sector interfaces at local level in the 32 local authority areas in Scotland. So the third sector had a, an ability to influence the direction of policy and service delivery at local level. The inquiry has received a statement from Helen Fiskin representing um, a, an organisation called Inclusion Scotland. It's an independent, non-party political representative organisation of disabled people across Scotland with a network of over 50 DPO members and partner organisations as well as individual members. And I want to give you the opportunity, Mr Swinney, to, to respond to what she tells us in her statement. Prior to January 2020, we were not invited to engage with government, UK, Scottish or local, regarding the extent to which inequalities and vulnerabilities should be factored into emergency preparedness and pandemic planning. We have routinely highlighted the obligation on the UK and Scottish governments to involve disabled people in the development of law and policy. Failure to do this adequately means that inequalities faced by disabled people were not sufficiently factored into emergency preparedness and pandemic planning. What does it say, Mr Swinney, about the partnership approach that such a significant organisation representing such an important and vulnerable constituency in society were not subject to engagement? I, I think I, I'm, I'm, I've read Heather Fuskin's um, witness statement and obviously I'm troubled by its contents because that's the last impression or feeling I would want a person like Heather Fuskin, the organisation that she represents, to have. Um, I think the government, the Scottish Government has gone to a lot of lengths, as I just have recounted through the, uh, the, the arrangements that we put in place to make sure the third sector have got a voice throughout the formulation of policy, whether that's around the design of um, Scottish Government policy or legislation that's brought forward. And, you know, there's extensive consultation with um, a third sector organisations about um, the formulation of policy within the Scottish Government. So I, I, I'm, I'm very troubled that that is the impression that Heather Fiskin has about the extent to which um, or, the organisation she represents has been involved. But it's not I just an impression, is it? It's, it's, she, she sets out quite clearly that having offered her the assistance of that organisation and, and acknowledging the importance of an organisation like that being involved in pandemic planning, um, her pleas were ignored. Well, well I, I regret the fact that that's the case, and um, I, I think that uh, you know that that can and should be rectified by the Scottish government. Thank you. I want to return now to uh, again to, to something that was covered in evidence this morning, and following on from your comments that. Uh, certainly, uh, at some point during the um, COVID outbreak, relations between the, the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government were not perhaps as cordial as they should have been. Um, it, it's the UK Resilience Forum and the presence or absence of Scottish Government at these meetings. And given that there was um, a, a level of um, or a lack of clarity following Miss Sturgeon's evidence about whether or not the Scottish Government were present at some of the meetings. I think it's important for us to look very briefly at the minutes. So can we look at the minutes of the first meeting, please, which are at 198919. This is the meeting on the 14th of July of 2021, chaired by Paymaster General Penny Mordaunt. And if we can scroll down, please. I don't think... Sturgeon was questioning 
that the minutes existed. No, no. I think she was questioning the accuracy yes. of the minutes. Or, or indeed whether or not um, the government were present. Yep. So we can see um, representatives from the following organisations who were in attendance. Scottish Government are the first in the list. Thank you. If we can now look to the second meeting, which is at 198920. This is a meeting that took place on the 3rd of May of 2022, chaired by Minister for the Cabinet Office, Michael Ellis. And if we can scroll down, please, to those present and absent. Thank you. If we can scroll up the page, please. Thank you. We can see invited organisations unable to attend Scottish Government. And then finally, 198921, which is the third meeting taking place on the 2nd of February of 2023, chaired by Oliver Dowden. And if we can look at those in attendance and those absent, please. Invited organisations unable to attend at the bottom of the page. We can see fourth bullet down Scottish Government. So it, it, it rather looks as if the minutes suggest that the Scottish Government were not present in, in meetings two and three. My question to you is this. Do you think that their absence from these meetings was a reflection on the poor quality of relations between the nations? It, no. But I wonder if I might just see on that the, the minute that last minute. I wonder if I could just see slightly higher up detail. Yes, just, the, just the, to, the one that's on the screen now. Yeah, please, yes. if I could just see that it, it's. Um, um, I just wanted to check. Oh. It says meeting held in. Sorry, it's. If we can go uh, to the next page, please. Forgive me for. Delaying Not at all. The process here. Um, because it's material to the answer I'm yes, about to course. give. Um, it says meeting held in person and by video conference. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, so, no, I don't think it's about the um, the um, nature of relations. Uh, in the short time I've had to explore this, and as I say, I'm, I'm no longer a member of government, so it takes me slightly longer to get answers to things uh, these no, days. No on the on the, the first meeting, Scottish government was present. On the second meeting, um, the. Scottish Government had planned to be present, but from what I've been advised, um, the video link was not working. And unfortunately, there were pe people ready to be involved, but could not participate because of technical issues. And on the third meeting, um, what I've been advised, and, and that's why I, I wanted to see this wording, was that it was an in-person meeting in London. Now, that minute contradicts what I've been told. And... Um, this was at a period where we were wrestling with winter weather challenges and our staff numbers were under pressure. I'm also not certain that these um, were invitations extended to ministers to participate. Um, so I, I would need to check whether that was a ministerial invitation. But around this time, or certainly around about this period, I discussed collaboration on this question with Michael Ellis, who was, I think at the time, a minister for the Cabinet Office. Yes, he or, was. Uh, and basically, we had an in-principle conversation about the necessity for cooperation. So to go back to the, the question you put to me, Ms Blackwell, did I think this was in it that the absence of the Scottish Government was in any way an indication of poor relations? On that point, no, unreservedly not. I think it was perhaps logistics and issues that got in the way, but I, I, I will make sure there is a definitive answer given to the inquiry to explain that point. Thank you very much. The final matter I want to ask you about is the National Performance Framework, and we can see this at 102917. This was established, I think, during your time in office, and it demonstrates that organisations in Scotland were working together, doesn't it, to um, achieve collective aspirations for, for all members of society. It's encouraging them to do so. Yes. It's 102917, please. Right, now, th this... this is a, a pictorial representation of the framework, isn't it? 
Can you explain to us how it works, please, Mr Swinney? Essentially, what um, at the core of it in the centre are um, a, a, an explanation of the purpose of Scottish public policy and the values that should underpin that um, in the circular area in the centre, and then uh, around about it are um, a series of um, national outcomes that we work with others in Scotland, um, whether they're in the uh, local authority partners, third sector organisations, the private sector, to agree uh, to, to try to achieve those outcomes. So they are aspirational about the, uh, the type of country we're trying to create. The reason that I wanted to highlight it during the course of your evidence was that the inquiry has heard from Sir Mark Walport, who spoke of the need, regardless of, of what approach government takes to future funding of national resilience, we perhaps should consider having a national resilience assessment across all areas of society in order to ensure that the best level of resilience is, is achieved. Do you think that that, that principle um, could work together with the, um, the, the, the national uh, performance framework that we see um, is, is currently in force in Scotland? It, I, I think that would be beneficial. And I think there is a, a, a constant challenge that we've got to be aware of on resilience issues about how the world is changing. If I can perhaps give a, 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 an illustration of that, um, we had a very severe and acute storm in the northeast of Scotland, Storm Arwen. There was a very extensive amount of damage, particularly to power cables. And what, of course, we discovered very, very quickly is that without power supplies, people's dependence on mobile technology, broadband, for which vast amounts of life now hinge, stops. And it's all very well saying, you know, we'll get the power back on tomorrow, but if the power can't go on for seven days, which in Storm Arwen was the case, that is an acute challenge to people. So the resilience effort is... Uh, uh, you know, the inquiry will understand I'm not much of an electrical engineer. Um, you, you need the proper people who know what they're doing to do that. Necessity for whole system approaches to resilience threats, whatever they happen to be, which Sir Mark is suggesting is, I think, a very welcome suggestion. Thank you very much. My lady, that concludes my questions for Mr Swinney. You have provisionally granted uh, permission for Scottish COVID bereaved to ask two discreet questions. May they do that now, please. Ms Mitchell. I'm obliged. I'm obliged, and in fact, um, one of the questions has already been dealt with in full uh, before with Ms Sturgeon, so I only need to take you to one question uh, now. Um, I'd like, Mr Swinney, for your comment on evidence given to this inquiry by Dr Jim McMenamin. He was a consultant epidemiologist in Health Protection Scotland, and as you will know, that's the lead body protecting the Scottish public from infectious diseases at the time uh, that pandemic planning was taking place and also at the time uh, just before the pandemic. Um, I, I'm not going to ask the inquiry to physically go to the statement, but just for the record, it's his statement, the inquiry at number 00018310. And in that statement to the inquiry, a paragraph 146, he explains that staffing numbers reduced at, um, at Health Protection Scotland between 2005 and 2020. Now, he indicated that this was due to a number of factors, but he specifically highlighted that one of the factors was the requirement placed on all NHS boards by the Scottish Government to make what he describes as cash release, releasing efficiency savings. And um, as a result of that, of course, clearly staffing numbers were affected. Further, he explains at paragraph 145 that the newly formed Public Health Scotland, so the body that was taking over um, from the other one, uh, the opening budget for that and staffing levels were not sufficient for Public Health Scotland to deliver the health protection and response required by the pandemic. 
from your position, having in your own words this morning the responsibility to make Scotland in as strong a position as it could be for any eventuality we had to face, do you accept the evidence of Dr Jim McMenamin that, amongst other factors, the Scottish Government requiring requirement to make cash savings in the previous body, the newly formed Public Health Scotland didn't have the budget or staffing levels to provide health protection for Scotland pre-pandemic? My, my view is that Public Health Scotland provided the Scottish Government our local authority partners, and I make reference to this in my own witness statement, um, with um, a huge amount of immensely reliable information and trusted information to enable us to form our decisions. So part of the benefit of the reform which was undertaken to establish um, Public Health Scotland was it was a body jointly um, owned, if I could use that terminology, between the government and local authorities. So there was... Um, often um, local authorities might dispute the evidence base that government has taken its decisions based on. On this example, there was none of that because we jointly owned the, bo the body of Public Health Scotland and there was wide confidence in the quality of the material and information that came from Public Health Scotland. So in that respect, I, I, I want to put that on the record about the strength of that information that was available from which decision making then came. Um, where I would um, accept is that um, there were financial um, pressures, there were financial pressures through every aspect of the public sector in Scotland, and, and you know, we've had a prolonged period of, um, of austerity, which has required us to make um, to live within very challenging uh, fiscal, uh, a very challenging fiscal environment in the Scottish government. Having said that, the health budget which would funded Public Health Scotland, would have been the budget that grew the most compared to any other aspect of the public of public budgets. So, yes, there would be efficiency savings required. They were required of everybody. But in that context, the health budget was growing to a greater extent than any other part of the public uh, budgets for which uh, the Scottish Government has responsibility. So what, in, what that answer is designed to do is to, is, to, is to acknowledge the strength of Public Health Scotland, uh, but also to accept that in a challenging fiscal environment, um, we have to ask organisations to perform strongly to, uh, to, to live within the financial resources we have available to us. Uh, so despite the fact that Public Health Scotland um, would have had the budget that grew most compared to other aspects of public life, it still wasn't in terms of budget or in terms of staffing prepared for the pandemic. Uh, well, I, 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 certainly from my experience of Public Health Scotland, I thought Public Health Scotland contributed formidably to the handling of the pandemic. And at no stage did I feel um, that we did not have the necessary information or interventions available to us from, um, well, particularly Dr McMenon and his colleagues at that time. So, from my perspective, I felt th they were able to make that contribution. But I do acknowledge that um, the, the burden of um, austerity and the requirement for efficiency savings has been uh, acute for many organisations. Thank you, Malidi. That concludes my question. Thank you very much, Ms Mitchell. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Swinney. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Moody. My lady, the final witness of the day and indeed of this week is Catherine Francis. Take the oath or affirm, please. I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth.
<laughs> Please sit down. Is your name Catherine Francis? It is. Ms Francis, thank you for coming to give evidence today and thank you for the assistance that you've given so far. Um, you've provided a witness statement which we'll look at um, on the screen in a moment. Before we confirm that this is your witness statement, I notice that you're quite softly spoken. That's not a criticism, but please keep your voice up and speak into the microphone so that the stenographer can hear you for the transcript. If you need a break during the course of your evidence, just ask and we will do that. So can you confirm, please, Ms Francis, that this is your witness statement? I can. Thank you. And uh, we don't need to go there, but can you also confirm that at the end you have signed it as being true to the best of your knowledge and belief? I have. Thank you. We can take that down, please. You are the Director General for Local Government, Resilience and Communities, a post which you have held since April of 2019. That's correct. I think that you joined the civil service in 2001, and prior to joining this department, you were Director of Public Services in Her Majesty's Treasury. That's correct. Thank you. Now, a warning, my lady, we are about to enter a realm of shifting acronyms and names, so I'm going to try and deal with it all at once so that we, we, we can then move on. Um, Miss Francis, I, I, I need your assistance in relation to uh, how the government is formed and its previous iterations, please. The Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, referred to as DLUC, which I'm going to use uh, during the course of your evidence, has operated in various forms and under various names over its lifetime, hasn't it? It was created in 2006 to replace the office of the Deputy Prime Minister, which had taken on the local government and regions portfolio from the Department for Transport, Local Government and the Regions in 2002. When it was first formed, the department was called the Department for Communities and Local Government, DCLG, but then in January of 2018, it became the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, MHCLG, and then in September of 2021, it became DLUC. Have I got that right? You have got that right. Good, right. Um, you are responsible in your role for what we know as RED, which is the Resilience and Emergencies Division, although it is now known as the Resilience and Recovery Directorate. Is that right? That is correct. I'm going to refer to it as RED during the course of your evidence. Just pausing there, why has that particular name changed? Um, it's changed for two reasons. Firstly, because um, this is part of our organisation which works on, on resilience planning and response, and we wanted uh, to recognise that we were thinking in a holistic way about how you recover from emergencies as well as how you just immediately respond. So the name has been changed for that purpose. It's also been changed to reflect, I think, over time, changes in the resourcing of that uh, team and set of teams. Um, it is now run by a director who has responsibility uh, solely for that function. And previously, it's been in slightly different arrangements over the years. All right. Thank you. Uh, the department is a ministerial department with oversight for local government and elections, homelessness, housing and home ownership, planning, building safety and levelling up and the union since 2021. Uh, but the inquiry is in, interested in its, in its oversight in terms of local government uh, because it oversees the local government sector and is responsible for the stewardship and oversight of local authorities in England, which includes ensuring that the frameworks for accountability and finance of local government are robust and that local authorities operate in accordance with what's described as a best value regime. That is a correct description of our uh, role nationally in relation to local government. I think it's important for the inquiry to understand um, that because local government does the, so many different things um, uh, in England, the way that this is organised is that the lead government department for a particular service area would take national oversight and accountability for that. So to give you an example, 
the Department for Health and Social Care would be responsible at national level for social care, even though local authorities are a major player in social care. Similarly, the Department for Education would be responsible for children's services. Um, and we as a department would be responsible for homelessness at a national policy level. Right. But you're correct in your description that we do the overarching framework. And in terms of resilience, which is of particular interest to this inquiry, your department shares joint competency for local resilience with the Cabinet Office, I think. Is that right? Yes. May I set this out very clearly for you? Please do. Thank you. <laughs> so the way to think about our department's role is in two different ways. Uh, chunks, if you like. The first is, as any other government department, we have lead areas of responsibility, and they are exactly as you have set out, housing, homelessness, building safety, and local government overarching um, accountancy and, uh, and stewardship for. Um, there is then a separate function that sits within our department, which is the Resilience and Emergencies Division, now renamed RED. Red. Yes. Now, RED performs a function which is not just for our own department. RED performs a function on behalf of all of government, central and local. Um, I can set out that role for you now if it's helpful. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, so this is all based in, in legislation and in the civil contingencies uh, framework and then the supporting uh, guidance that goes with this. So at national level, civil contingencies are arranged in such a way as you have the Cabinet Office with overarching responsibility. Um, and they have responsibility in terms of policy, known as doctrine, for local uh, emergencies planning too. As you have probably heard from other people, there's often a lead government department which takes forward a particular risk and plans for that. Locally speaking, we have a situation defined in legislation where category one responders, hospitals, local authorities, blue lights, um, have a responsibility for planning for emergencies and then responding in emergencies. They also have a responsibility to come together in local resilience forums, and those forums are in place to enable planning and response when it needs a cross-agency uh, response locally. The role of RED in that wider system is, in a sense, relatively simple. It is the connecting team between the national level civil contingencies arrangements and the local LRFs. So right. there's 38 LRFs in England will have red connecting officers working with them, and they will work with them on planning and also in response. I hope that's clear. It is. Thank you very much. Um, local government is responsible for a range of services for people and businesses in defined areas. And, and I'd like your assistance, please, now on on how the local government levels work. So there are different types of local authorities, aren't there? Correct. Can you tell us what they are, please? Um, yes, so there are a range of different types. Um, there are some authorities, uh, metropolitan authorities and universe, um, uh, integrated authorities that have uh, responsibility for a full range of services. Um, to give you an example, that would include uh, social care, children's services, those sorts of services. It would include libraries. It would also include um, responsibilities for refuse collection, things like that, and planning. Um, in other parts of the country where we don't have that unitary authority that integrates both tiers, um, that can be split between a county, which holds some responsibilities, and underneath it, some district councils. Right. And they have separated uh, lines of responsibilities that are set out very clearly in all legislation. Um, for example, districts would do um, uh, refuse and that sort of service, and uh, at the county level you might find adult social care and children's services. So, so d differing types of local authorities? It is a patchwork across the country, um, well understood by practitioners, but it is not regular. And then in addition to that, in some parts of the country, there are combined authorities or mayoral combined authorities. They bring together the authorities in the area um, and have certain accountabilities that are set out uh, in a series largely of devolution deals and then legislation that follows those. If it would What's help it? the inquiry, they tend to be less directly responsible for the public services that are affected immediately in, in, in a pandemic type response. Right, but what's, what's the interrelation between the local resilience forums and, and local authorities? Is there a direct correlation between the area that a local resilience forum covers 
and, and a local authority, or do some local resilience forums cross boundaries? Um, thank you for asking that question. So in the legislation, the 38 local resilience forums are set out as being um, along the same footprint as police authorities. Right. So that is what defines them. Um, you can imagine that a local resilience forum will sometimes be responding to a, a, a situation where the police maybe are the lead agency. So one can see why it's set up. There are authorities. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, 38. Police. 38. I thought there were four... I would imagine your greater knowledge on the. No, no, well, I, was just, I, I, I thought it was over 40 police forces. Sorry, uh, forgive me for interrupting. I, it, it may have changed, I don't know, I'm afraid. I can't help you on that one. Um, you asked about the connection with local authorities. Yes. Because they are category one responders, they are required to engage with the local resilience forum um, of which they are a part. As um, under the Civil Contingencies Act? Uh, exactly. Yes. Um, in practice, what that can mean is that you will have a local resilience forum that has several councils in it. That right. is perfectly standardised. And you may find that councils don't all individually attend. They can nominate each other to attend on each other's behalf. So the department's role in preparedness and risk management for civil emergencies, as we've established, sits within RED. And um, you've explained how RED really sits between central government and local government and, and provides a conduit for advice. Does that extend to assurance? So, so what level of assurance does RED have over plans and arrangements that are local, that, that might be held at a local level? Um, OK, just to break this down. So firstly, I think we do have civil contingencies responsibilities as a department outside RED, as any other, yes. as, as any other uh, department would. But just looking at RED, um, its role is to act as the connecting point between central government and LRFs. So um, in the preparedness phase, RED's role is to act as a critical friend of local planners, um, to check that they uh, are asking themselves the right question because the accountability for planning lies with them, to share with them and point them in the direction of guidance that's been issued so that they can understand that, to ensure that they understand uh, the national risk registers that are issued, and then, of course, local planners then have to make their own community risk registers, um, and to help local partners identify risks. In a response phase, um, RED's interaction would build on that sort of relationship and effectively they would act as a communicator between the local LRF and the centre, highlighting where there are issues that need to be resolved um, and facilitating the transfer of information between central and local. For the avoidance of doubt, RED has no role in assuring the local plan because the local plan is the responsibility of the local responders and uh, legislation and accountability very clearly sits there. All right. The the identity of the, the person that sits in red who communicates at a local level, is that person called a resilience advisor? They are called a resilience advisor when they're planning and advising, yes. Right. And in the event of, um, of, of a response period, if you like, does the name of that person change to become a local, a government liaison officer? They do. And the reason for the change of name is literally that they turn into a function where they are liaising very proactively between the local and the national to make sure messages get through and to make sure they're helping to solve problems and handing things to lead departments and things where it's needed. Is it more often than not the case that that person is the same person, the resilience advisor is the same person as the government liaison officer? Um, often and usually, um, we may come on to this later, at points where the whole countries' systems are activated, um, as in a pandemic response, we had to work um, on shift bases and, and with a bit more variety, but normally we would try for as much continuity as is possible. All right. Do you think it's perhaps unnecessary and a little confusing that the name of that person changes or the title of that person changes, or do you think it's helpful? I, I think for people who work in the system, they understand absolutely right. how these systems work. <laughs> In terms of oversight and assurance, you've explained why RED does not hold um, a, a responsibility of assuring that the local plans are in place, etc. 
Do you think it would help if Red did have that level of assurance and accountability to, to, um, to provide at that level comfort that the, that the local plans are dealing with the national risks appropriately? Um, I, th I think it potentially could be quite confusing right. done in that way because um, what we are trying to achieve in, in RED is a situation where RED supports the local people who are accountable for planning and helps them in a supportive collegiate way to assure themselves that they are at an appropriate level of preparedness. Um, and that accountability and the clarity of that accountability is relatively important, I think. Um, I would say two additional things, if you would let me. Um, the first, I think, is that um, that's not the same as saying that RED uh, disengages from the process of local plans and local risk assessments. If I can take an example in, in pandemic preparedness, um, we may come on to it later. I mean, RED has participated in a lot of the exercises over the years that have been important in pandemic preparedness. But we've also taken steps um, over the years. I mean, in December 2017, we interviewed all LRFs and said, I think, 35, 38, and asked them about their levels of preparedness, fed back what they said um, to central government departments to aid that communication. RED has additionally run workshops for LRFs to attend and had... Uh, central government uh, partners there as well, so that they could work together on uh, uh, the issues that needed to be grappled with in terms of planning for a pandemic. Um, the Red have also facilitated a sort of local uh, resilience forum engagement group to work through particular issues with central government partners. So although they're not assuring um, local plans whatsoever, um, Red's interlocutor role, uh, when it's a major risk such as pandemic planning, um, extended as far as uh, facilitating the communication in those sort of joined up ways between local and national. And the second thing to say, I think, is just that we, we do recognise that LRFs need to be able to assure themselves and have good accountability locally for their own plans. And although um, I believe it wasn't set out in my witness statement because it postdates it, um, we have made some uh, further announcements about further work on that. All right, thank you. And um, at the heart of the system is the principle of subsidiarity, is yes. that right? Correct. Um, and, and can you explain to us what Red's approach is to that and how it ensures that, that, that matters cascade down in the way that, that that principle expects? Well, the principle of subsidiarity is that decisions should be taken at the lowest possible level and coordination should happen at the at the lowest necessary level. Um, in, in general, RED's approach is therefore to make sure that information is cascaded down, um, if I can use that terminology, to local resilience fora. So to give you an example, RED will have facilitated uh, events following workshops and things, following the issue of the national security risk assessment to make sure that every LRF in the country understood that and could dock that into their plans. Um, RED's general approach is to share as much information as is possible with local resilience for it. We do that um, depending on the security of the information and also um, the sign-off of the lead government department, but we have a very strong culture of sharing uh, with local colleagues. And in relation to a pandemic, the preparedness here really was whole system. So Red's approach to subsidiarity there was to dock into the central structures, which you'll have heard a lot about, the pan flu readiness boards and structures like that, um, and to convey there what local resilience forums were saying, and then to facilitate the flow of information into local resilience forums, to be part of joint exercising locally and nationally, and to facilitate the flow of messages back up and down through the system. So I, I think, in summary, it is an approach based on subsidiarity. Yes. It is just a whole system approach when planning for a pandemic because some elements of it involve national decision-making and some, quite rightly, either LRF level or more local decision-making. It's even it's, more local than that. It is local partners who know their communities. The and we know yes. that um, local planners are very good at dealing with their communities. 
Well, let's uh, have a look at a couple of documents, please. The first is a report from the C19 National Foresight Group entitled COVID-19 Pandemic Third Interim Operational Review. Thank you. Now, this is dated October of, of 2020, so it's outside of our, um, of, of our module one time period. But I, I want to look at page 22, please, because it... it, it sets out some concerns that were felt um, by from delegates. If we can highlight the second paragraph there, please. This was um, a, a group that had gathered evidence from all but one um, local resilience forum, and it said delegates report that they did not feel understood or trusted by central government and ministers. They have reported that ministers and some government departments still do not understand what local resilience forums and SCGs are, what these structures can and cannot do, and what the difference is between an LRF and an SCG. Is that a strategic commissioning group? an SCG. Coordination group. Co coordination group. This hampers the ability to integrate the national and local approach as the expectations from the national decision makers are misplaced and misaligned with the civil contingencies frameworks or guidance materials are incorrectly framed or include incorrect details. Is that something that you recognise, Ms Francis? Um, so I was aware of this work being done at the time um, and indeed read uh, attended some of the sessions to hear firsthand because um, it was important to learn from practitioners and what they were feeling at the time. Um, I, I think, not, not to deflect the query you're making, but I, this is October 2020. Yes. And I think quite a lot of what we're hearing from delegates here is um, their reflection on, on evolution during the pandemic and how they felt certain things were going. Um, the distinction between an LRF and an SCG um, is, of course, important in operational work. What um, is the difference? The distinction is, is, is literally that an LRF is, is the group that brings together all of the Category 1 responders. Yes. But when you go into response, you need a strategic group that is just running the response, and that is designated by the LRF. That is the, the, the SCG. To avoid a huge number of letters creeping in in central government. I think possibly sometimes people referred to LRFs when they meant SCGs, but I don't think that would have meant that central government departments didn't understand what an LRF was or indeed an SCG. Um, I think this question about feelings of trust between central government and ministers um, is one that one really has to act, ask local partners about um, we often heard from local partners that they wanted to um, have advanced notice of decisions that were being taken, um, and sometimes they asked about the sharing of information in a timely way. I think some of that is coming out here. Um, and from a red perspective, um, and indeed a wider departmental perspective, we shared material when it was um, authorised to be shared, when decisions have been taken, and so on and so forth. All right, we can take that down, please, and let's replace it with 177803, which is the witness statement of Mark Lloyd from the Local Government Association. He's going to be coming to give evidence to the inquiry at a later date. Could we go to page 51 and have a look at paragraph 199, please? Thank you. The LGA's view is that in a number of cases, the principle, this is of subsidiarity, is not currently being applied effectively. Areas. Areas, I'm so sorry. In a number of areas, the principle is not currently being applied effectively. Subsidiarity implies that local agencies are trusted, equal partners in emergency preparedness and response, which, in appropriate circumstances, are empowered to lead local resilience work. However, there are a number of examples of practice suggesting otherwise. And if we could read on to the next paragraph, please. As noted, a persistent issue which has undermined trust and therefore the principle of subsidiarity has been the extent of central government's willingness to share information with local partners. 
there have been repeated challenges with central government sharing intelligence and information about national risks, for example, planning assumptions, reasonable worst case scenarios, on a limited basis or not at all, thereby undermining the ability of local areas to undertake timely and informed local planning. Thank you. It, it appears from, from what Mark Lloyd has to say, it's certainly in those two paragraphs, it is that there was a lack of sharing of information or, or certainly a perception at the local level of not being fully informed about the national risk assessment and, and, and what lay behind it. Do, do you agree, Ms Francis, that if the risk assessments at a local level are going to be meaningful and adequate, there needs to be an understanding of the assumptions that are being used at a national level to perform the national risk assessment? So the national risk security assessment is shared with every LRF in England. Um, there are elements of it that can be secure and they can be accessed through secure routes. Um, LRFs themselves nominate who has access to that information. Um, so, and we use the LRF to cascade that information because it is the named way for doing so in civil contingencies approaches in legislation. Just so that I, I understand it correctly, that there is a, a confidential, there's a, a secret part of the national security risk assessment, isn't there? There's a, 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 an element of it which is not public facing. Um, are you suggesting that in relation to that part of the assessment process, there is a facility whereby the local resilience forum can have access to that, but it requires the nomination of a person, presumably who has security clearance to do that. So my understanding is that the NSRA is shared with every LRF in the country. Um, and certainly in 2019, when it was updated, RED and the CCS ran a series of events with local resilience for it so that they understood changes to the NS NSRA sorry, uh, and appreciated how that could affect them. Um, that is not the same as saying that uh, every local partner saw the NSRA or the uh, associated documents. An LRF would each have had to decide who had access to that material. Um, and uh, my understanding is that the areas that are more secure are treated in a more secure way. Um, but it would have been for the LRF to determine who saw that. Um, and I would certainly expect key people to have seen the key documentation. So does it surprise you that, that um, Mr Lloyd's uh, opinion appears to be that there have been repeated challenges about the sharing of information? I think that he's making two points, if I read this right. So the first is around the national risk assessments, where, as I've said, it was shared in the appropriate way down the appropriate routes. The second point I think he's making is a general question about whether information more widely was shared. Um, and I think I'd say two things here. I mean, the first is that before the pandemic, local planners had the same um, epidemiological uh, sort of assumptions that were there in all of the all of the documentation as, as, as national planners were using from the 2011 and 2013 documentation um, and were working using the same planning uh, frameworks um, as, as central government planners um, and I think it, we also shared with them updated uh, COVID material when it was available so I I understand that local partners, and we did hear local partners saying, are you sharing as much as you can? But I think in terms of pandemic preparation, the basic building blocks were all uh, common across central and national government. Uh, the exercises that we were doing um, were on common bases, and same for planners. I, I would say that in the pandemic, things moved at pace, um, and sometimes that may have led local planners to say, could you not have told us this earlier? Yes. Totally accept that. That's absolutely something we heard. But in terms of, of preparedness and and the, the, the national risk assessment and, and the ability of, of that to be carried forwards and cascading down to a local level, do you think there is a disconnect between what happens at a national and a local level? Or are you confident that, that there is um, sufficient quality of information flowing from the top to the bottom? 
Well, I think if we set out the national risk assessments, we hold a series of events to explain the changes, and then LRFs are required, and I, I think do uh, understand what's in the national risk assessments, but that, that's acceptable. I think they then need to work out at a local level, and this can be challenging, actually, how the local community risk assessment works, because you may have a part of the country which has a different balance of risk assessment to another for entirely legitimate reasons. Um, maybe it's subject to more flooding than another part of the country or something. We see those sorts of variations. But yes, I think local planners had those framework pieces. What are regional resilience teams? So are you referring to the arrangements which were in place before RED started in our department? Yes. Yes. Um, so before 2011, yes. uh, government was structured in a different way and there were a series of government offices across England. Um, in that context, uh, there were a series of regional resilience teams um, and they were cabinet office teams uh, who reported directly into the cabinet office and they did what the name suggests actually a very similar function to that which red performs um, and has performed since 2011 but spread out across the country yes exactly uh, located in those government offices w which no longer exist and, and yes. didn't after 2011 and um <laughs> If it were to be suggested that consideration perhaps should be given to the reinstatement of regional resilience teams to add um, a, a, an additional level of um, assistance and perhaps combined with a level of assurance between central and local government, do you think that that's a, an idea that's worth considering? Um. There are very different views around the country on the regional um, situation. Um, and I think that we think that the regional position is more complex than, in resilience terms than existed uh, prior to 2011. Um, to explain that a little bit more, there are some parts of the country where the collaboration jointly between resilience planners on the old regional footprint still continues to feel relatively natural, if I can put it that way. So to draw an example, the northeast or the southwest, uh, the LRFs in those areas tend to work jointly in a way that is very close to the original um, regional footprint. And RED works with them on that basis as well. If they want to work like that, we support them on that basis. But there are other parts of the country where that geography doesn't feel so natural maybe because there's a very rural area next to a very urban area, and the connection there just feels less significant than maybe other structural connections. So RED works in a way that we support collaboration across different LRFs in the way that works for whatever the task that needs to be done. So if I can give you an example uh, in preparations for the possibility of leaving the EU with no deal, we worked with different LRFs across the country who had ports and airports. And clearly, they weren't all in one region, but they shared a common set of issues that they needed to deal with. And so we would flex our approach that way. Um, I should just add one more point, which is that RED does work on a regional basis. We have four regional offices. Right. Um, at various times, it's been four or five. But all of the workshops that we've run in pandemic planning, um, for example, our, our workshops in, in, I think it was in early 2018, were run in four locations so that if connections needed to be made on the regional basis, we were facilitating that. Right. So, so, so from what you have said, RED takes the issue that's being raised, considers the area in which it's being raised, and prepares and presents a, a suitable solution. And, and, and it's, a, it's got flexibility within the organisation in order to be able to do that. That is a very good way of putting it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I want to move on to resources now, please. Um, the inquiry will hear uh, that in terms of local government funding, um, there were real terms reductions over the period of time that, that this inquiry is, is involved in. Um, up to, in some cases, 57%. That evidence is going to be coming from Mr Lloyd. And that, however 
large the reduction was. There was a significant amount of concern at a local government level as to whether or not there was sufficient uh, resource in order to be able to carry out proper preparation for any civil emergency happening. Did you witness the impact of reduction in funding or changes in funding in your day-to-day -day relationship with local government? Um, can I correct one thing for the record? Yes, first, please. please. Um, I think you said that there was a 57% reduction in local government budgets. Um, I, I, what, I, what I intended to say was that the councils um, had their core funding from central government reduced, and in some areas that amounted to a real terms reduction of 57%. So I think that's a quote from Mark Lloyd's witness statement. That's I think exactly it's where it's coming from. For the, uh, the, the, the inquiry to understand um, that that is not a measure of the resources available to local government, particularly because it doesn't include resources from council tax. Mark Lloyd, in his witness statement, does make reference to another figure which is drawn from the National Audit Office. Yes. Um, and I would strongly recommend that we use that one because it uh, represents a holistic view of uh, resources for councils. Um, it's at paragraph 287 in Mark Lloyd's witness statement. Do you agree that there was a reduction? Absolutely. Right. And, and my question was, did you witness any impact of, of that reduction in your day-to-day -day work to, with um, local government? Um, so there was definitely a really significant reduction in local government resources in the 2010s as part of the wider government approach to uh, fiscal policy. What I've witnessed varies a lot between different councils. Um, uh, and it's hard to draw simple conclusions about the budget reductions and preparedness for a, a pandemic, actually. Um, that's firstly, I think, because councils make their own decisions about what they're going to prioritise within the statutory framework. And so they will naturally have looked at... Um, where they had statutory responsibilities, like yes. to plan for emergencies, um, and for big public services, uh, which were critical, and will have formed a view about what was necessary. Um, because they take different locally-based decisions as well, they also take quite different strategies, um, and it's hard to generalise. And they're, they're quite good, and have been very effective organisations working in a creative way to get out efficiencies over this era. So I would say I've seen council's capacity being affected. That is the case. Um, I've also seen them working in a very efficient way through different reductions. At an overall level, when you look at the choices they've made on services like adult social care and children's services, they've tended to try to uphold the expenditure in those areas um, and make reductions elsewhere. Um, and yes, I don't think you can draw quite a straight line from the resourcing question to their capability and their, their planning, because they've seemed quite resilient organisations to me and quite adaptable than they were in the pandemic. In your witness statement, you make reference to best value duty. What does that mean? Um, there's a duty in uh, legislation that councils have regard to efficiency and economy and improvement, um, uh, which is uh, a requirement on all councils essentially to govern themselves well and to continue with due regard um, uh, to those principles. They, the best value principle has been used when councils are in um, severe difficulty, but it's a relatively unusual um, uh, context, a relatively unusual intervention um, to make on a best value grounds. Um, most councils govern themselves exceptionally well and uh, uh, are very effective at managing this sort of resource pressure. Do you think that at the, the present time, the subsidiarity model is still capable of working effectively, um, given the level of funding that, that local government has? Absolutely. Right. Other issues relating to the relationship between RED and the local government uh, but both local authorities and local resilience forums. 
Would it assist in the planning that they have to do for civil emergencies for there to be one single repository of material that they need to consider? Um, that there's the, the, the inquiry has received information that, that there isn't at present a single repository for relevant guidance and information on emergency preparedness, and that that uh, consideration of, of creating that is, is something that should happen. So the Cabinet Office hold um, a system called Resilience Direct, which can be accessed by LRFs, um, and some of the guidance is also available on public websites. We have heard exactly the same uh, feedback from local planners, and you will have seen in some of our documentation attached to my witness statement um, that that's reflected in some of their feedback. The inquiry has also heard that, in the main part, guidance um, that, that reflects upon all civil emergencies, but in particular pandemic planning, did not... Um, cover the issue of non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, do you think that going forwards, that is something that the involvement of that in, in planning documents and guidance given to those uh, in charge of local government about non-pharmaceutical interventions would be um, a, a welcome addition? Um, so local planners for the pandemic were using the same planning guidance documents and the same assumptions as, as nas national. Um, and, and thus, as you'll have heard from other witnesses and you'll have seen from the published material, there were elements in there and what happened in the pandemic that weren't included in there. Yes. Um, uh, in terms of what should be in a planning document for pandemic, um, whether flu or otherwise, I would absolutely defer to um, the Department of Health and Social Care because they are the lead government department in defining what should be included in that. So I hope that answers your question. Um, there, were, there were gaps in, in terms of the comparability of what we were planning for and what ultimately happened. They have the same information as central government departments and I would absolutely defer to DH. When one considers that um particularly taking into account the, the model or the, the principle of subsidiarity, that it is those people on the ground acting locally, following plans and guidance locally, that, that are in the greatest need of, of practical guidance, then it, it is imperative, is it not, that, that the guidance that they follow includes the practical application of things like non-pharmaceutical interventions. It, it's absolutely necessary that the plans that everyone is following are as close as can be reasonably expected to be what is likely to happen and that everybody has a shared understanding of that and that in exercising and in reflecting on exercises and in uh, workshopping things we are talking about the same thing whether at a national or local level. I'd finally like to ask you about uh, the vulnerable and what level of um, involvement, planning and guidance has had in terms of identifying those who are the most vulnerable in society and how they need to be um, uh, accounted for in terms of planning and also in terms of any response to a civil emergency. You say in your witness statement that RED engages with uh, voluntary community and social enterprise partners in preparedness, response and recovery planning. This is primarily through LRF engagement where VCSE partners are core partners within individual LRFs. Can you explain to us please how that works? Yes, certainly. So, um, the department is not the lead department in, in national government in terms of overall relationship with the voluntary and community yes. sector. But it is absolutely critical to emergency preparedness and response that the voluntary and community sector are part of that. Um, the guidance that sets out how LRFs should work stipulates that um, LRFs should be expected to work with volunteering organisations at the right footprint 
Um, and so the way that we support uh, LRFs on that is simply to make sure that they are aware of that guidance and, and to, to make sure they factor it in. Um, I think more precisely in terms of preparing from RED, um, if I can give you an example, at the national level, we try and make sure we have some connections with lead VCS organisations. So, for example, the British Red Cross has attended our twice yearly LRF's chairs um, a conference on very regular occasions and is a, a regular attendee and invitee. Um, but then we channel most of our work with the VCS simply by looking at the LRF and what the LRF is doing. Um, to elaborate yet further, when we are in response and indeed in planning, we often find that the LRF area itself is quite a large footprint for engaging with charities. So in the pandemic, a lot of very kind people gave of their time and effort, and they did so at what I would describe as a hyper-local level. So often that was corralled and organised by local authorities who themselves would then be part of the LRF structure. So there's some engagement by us at the national level, um, but our primary engagement with the VCS is to um, ask LRFs to do that. And then we absolutely acknowledge that local authorities and even smaller partners are, are, are working collaboratively with the VCS. All right. Well, you mentioned the British Red Cross. Um, so I'd like to display part of the witness statement that we have from Mr. Adamson, who's the chief executive there. It's at 182613. And if we can go to page 10, please, and look at paragraph 43. Thank you. The British Red Cross has long believed that increased engagement between the CCS and the voluntary sector would be beneficial for the UK's emergency preparedness. It is in that context that, in 2019, the British Red Cross and other voluntary organisations sought to engage with the CCS. Our focus was on seeking to develop a strategy with the government for the voluntary sector to react to a range of emergencies based on the lessons learned from responding to the multiple emergency events of 2017. The intention was for the voluntary sector to offer something more than the gold and silver and bronze model, which usually dominates emergency responses, in particular to focus on the human aspects of recovery that are sometimes forgotten. The experience was somewhat dispiriting, and there appeared to be a lack of curiosity on the part of the CCS regarding what the voluntary sector could provide. And further down, please. I had also previously approached RED in 2018 and received a more positive response, including a proposed approach for the CCS for a three-way meeting. However, this meeting did not materialise. Could more be done, Ms Francis, to engage with the voluntary sector and to ensure that, so far as both planning and response is concerned, those most vulnerable in society and who require the services or, and, and assistance from the voluntary sector are engaged with, both, both at a national and also at a level at which RED was uh, and, and is um, existing. So, I just, I mean, a lot of what you've just read out is in relation to CCS, not RED. Um, uh, I don't know about the particular meeting that Mike Adamson's alluding to in, in, in paragraph 44. But, 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 but forgive me, you, you, were, you were talking in, in your yes. previous answer Indeed. about engagement at a national level with, with CCS. Be, between CCS and the... And no, the I was British. talking about engagement at national level, primarily between RED and the British Red Cross. But I also noted that the British Red Cross often attended yes. our joint, our joint uh, LRF chairs, uh, call with, which is joint with CCS there. Um, I mean, I, I think that there's always more to be done working with the voluntary and community sector. Um, it has an incredibly distinct and important role. It is exactly, as my Addison notes, not the same as the role that is provided through gold, silver, bronze structures. Um, so I, I accept his feedback that um, local resilience partners, whether that be an LRFs or other fora, um, can continue to build uh, their connections with the VCS. I also noted in his witness statement that he talked about progress that had been made about interrelations with the VCS um, over the course of the pandemic. 
um, which seemed to me to be positive and were led by the lead government department for the, DC, for the VCS. In terms of Red's engagement with the VCS, um, as I've said, the national engagement in the LRF's uh, chairs forum has been the principal one. Um, and we have looked across the sector at how people are engaging with the VCS to see if we can learn any uh, lessons or take any cues from that. We haven't yet moved forward with the work. Because if RED is, is expecting to be able to rely upon the British Red Cross and other organisations within the, the VCS in the event of a response to a civil emergency, um, that is likely to, to make more of an impact if the VCS it has also been engaged in the preparation, isn't it? RED is and asking planning. local responders, but RED is acting as a communicator between central and, la and local government and structures. RED is asking that local responders who are responsible in legislation are content that they have plans. And the Cabinet Office guidance which is very sensible, expects LRFs to have good connections with the BCS. I completely agree that good connections with the BCS is a vital part of the mixture, part of the recipe of good response and good planning. Um, I'm not sure I can go very much beyond that. All right. um, our recent publications on this express a desire to integrate preparedness and response more closely with communities, which of course is in part about the VCS, though not entirely. Thank you very much. Would you excuse my back, please? Uh, my lady, there are no uh, questions which, for which permission has been granted, and so that concludes Miss Francis's evidence. And I think uh, we all had enough acronyms for one day. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's not your fault, I'm afraid. It's systemic. Yes. Um, if only it was enough acronyms for a lifetime, but I fear it's not. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for your help, Ms Francis. Thank you. Right. Um, as far as next week is concerned, obviously we're not sitting tomorrow. It's a Friday. We don't normally sit on a Friday. We had hoped to sit Monday morning, but for various reasons... It hasn't proved possible, so I will next sit again at 2 o'clock Monday afternoon. Thank you, my lady. Thank you.